We can't do what I wanted to do, which was demo with the power um, walk behind tractor and ATV to show using the, the roller crimper because the ground is just too wet. We'll make the, the walk behind will just get stuck and spin its wheel and dig itself in. And the ATV, even if it works, will make a horrible mess. So we're just not gonna be able to do that. We'll, we have videos of what they do though. So you'll get to see it anyways. And what we can do is check out and see what a scythe and a homemade little tool like I told you to make. Um, I wish I, if I knew you'd come, I, I would have said bring it, you know, so we can compare. Um, I got to talk to Toon at the grand opening of Fifth Season and proposed all the stuff we're going to talk about today to her. And her husband happens to be a blacksmith. I said, you can make the perfect tool. Mine would make him just, you know, yeah, right, cringe big time, you know. I am not very far up on the adeptness with tools level. Much better cook and grower than I am builder. Okay, so let's go outside and look at a few tools. And I'll first give you as much as you need to know about what we're trying to do. We'll go much more into it, but I just don't want to take the chance that we miss the sunshine and then it pours the rest of the day. So basically, the two things we can do right now is scythe or crimp the cover crops out there. Okay, it's because hand tools can still work. Scythes actually do better in a little bit of wetness. Because it might rain at any minute, we're going to go outside and do the two things we can do, which is kill the cover crop, or do our best to try and kill the cover crop. I'll explain to you afterwards why I'm not so sure we're going to kill one particularly resilient cover crop, which I don't recommend for no-till growers, which is vetch. Vetch does not want to die, and I'm not sure. But this might do a better job than anything. You know, It does look like a medieval torture device, doesn't it, um, than anything else I've, I've played with. But the size, if you're good with it, should probably do it too. I don't claim to be an expert with a scythe at all. I bought it for this class to show you an option. Why I did that was we have a video, which I guess is going to come up pretty soon, um, with Larry, what's his last name? Yeah. Um, and he is an expert with scythes, sells really wonderful ones, much better than this. Um, and he was scything some rye. And as he did it, I thought, that's a perfect no-till tool for very small scale, you know? Um, because you can lay that stuff right down. What's wrong with a weed eater or a lawnmower or a bush hog is they throw it everywhere. And you don't want it everywhere. You want it right in that bed so you can plant through it. And ideally, you want it laid down pretty neatly so that you can easily part it, plant through it, and pull it back. And so this, with skill, can be done. I'm not skilled. You, know? uh, you all can take a shot at it. I can see how I can get there pretty quick. I was learning real fast. But I wanted to leave the cover crops we have for you all to practice on. Anybody that wants to can have a whack at this, no pun intended. Okay, um, so that's the one tool. And then this one here, this is the one that I bet to Doug made a much better version of than, than I did. But um, I learned about this from Rodale, and I meant to make one forever, and I did for this class. Um, we have a roller, so we don't really need it. But I'm realizing that possibly this could make the use of the flail mower easier. Because can you see out there where all the really dark green is? dense green, that's vetch. And when we have to try and flail mow, which is a special kind of mower that has chains that cut and flail it and chop it up fine so that you can easily get through it rather than throwing it all and drop it right in place. When we try to flail mow, it's a process of like dipping that thing up way high, which probably doesn't work with OSHA, and like chewing at it and then dropping it down and coming back and forth. If you could knock it all down with this, I think the flail has the power to just chew it up. You know, it's just a matter that it can't get you know, it's being overwhelmed from, all, from top and bottom. And this might actually fix this. So this here, if you go to the Rodale no-till site, they show this as the option for the home gardener. I made a slight variation. They just showed the person using a chain with, 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 with a rope handle on each side. When I did that, I would have needed much more chain, much more weight to get the full width of the bed, width of the bed because the rope pulls it up. So it's, it comes like this. So I made it be straight, you know, with far more <laughs> plastic ties than you probably need. <laughs> but it should hold, and that's what counts. So we're going to go out and we're going to play with these two, okay? I'll talk more about all the other tools towards the end. We're going to look at a bunch of tools. Um, we have a John Morrison coming with the World Help. I'm forgetting what the last name, the last word of that, of that organization is, but it's this neat organization that's developed a walk-behind tractor, no-till cedar. And so he's going to demo that. It will be in the greenhouse because it's too wet out here to do it. And he'll be here at 4 o'clock. And then we'll also play with this if people are interested. And anybody wants to can try that. But I have to warn you, 
that was imported from Brazil, so it's not readily available. <laughs> but all of this really, well, a quick question. How many people here are on a small farm scale? How many people here, how many people here are on a small farm scale? Okay, so this stuff here is applicable to a small farm. Our market garden, right? That's the same difference, right? And all the home gardeners, I don't think you're ever gonna buy that thing, you know? I think you're gonna use this, the scythe, this, you know, and this. And someday down the road, and maybe this, flamer. Someday down the road, when enough of everybody's doing it, Troy built and the other makers of small walk behind tractors will come out with reasonably affordable pieces that you can buy and put on those machines. Right now, the roller we got, $1,300, was made for us. You know, They're not readily available. And until they are, I don't see a lot of backyard gardeners buying them. You know? But these tools here will do the trick. We, the truth is, we've been no-till, well, we've got a flail mower, which helps. But the size should replace that. We've had nothing but a flail mower in these from 2011 till now. And we've only worked one half of one bed and all that time. And we only did that because we were in a hurry to get crops in and it would have taken longer to do anything else. And we just, we really wanted that crop in right that minute. So you can do it all without tools. Tools, you know, I mean, with the basic hand tools. It's mostly just the knowledge. And really, our biggest tool is the seeds of cover crops. That's the big tool. That's, and, you're, and much of my slide is gonna be about that because those do the work for us, you know? And they have superpower. They have the sun, you know? They do work that we could never believe. They open up the soil better. They build the fertility better. I mean, that is the tool we're going to talk about the most. But we do have to know how to manage them. And I also want to let you know, this is one of many classes that we're going to do on this. I just put this out there because we need to start the discussion. And indeed, once I start it, I remember now I have to go get a planting pipe because I met Zev Friedman in the, Friedman in the parking lot of um, French Broad Food Co-op. Co and he talked about him and Leon, an organic farmer in, um, I, think, I think, Rutherford County, um, using planting pipes to put seeds through the cover crop. So I went to Lowe's and got a dollar sixty-five five-foot piece of conduit. And that's a planting tool, you know. And then I got an email from John Rowland of our farm. And he said, I've got these gorgeous pictures of no-till spinach. I'll send them to you. And I'll tell you the story later on. But I realized there's... A lot of us are trying to figure out no-till, and it's brand new. So everybody's got ideas. And so next time, I think it's going to be a symposium. You know, I'm going to put out a call, you know, not long after we schedule the class, to people with ideas, people, and see who's got the new ideas and stuff. It's not a competition, right? It's just to find the people with the, the ideas that we don't all already have, and we'll do it as a discussion, you know. And by the way, today, anybody who's been playing with this, who's doing stuff you don't see us doing, I love learning in these classes, too, okay? All right, let's head out. So there's a couple things to know before we start here. One is, there's another whole process that I started in December that you can't see here. And Jeremy Greist, who works here, predicted that would be the case. He said, you're not going to be able to find that row. And it was true. Right down here, and we'll, if we move aside the cover crop, you can see it. There is bare soil. Because last winter, I came through with juice pulp, like right there and leaves and piled them up about that high. So there's a strip down here that once if we flailed this and we cut this out of the way, we probably could push that walk behind, push no-till cedar because we don't have all the roots and stuff in here. And that's a strategy you can do. You can have a whole row of cover crop, a whole area that's heavily cover cropped and just put essentially sheet compost down where you want to plant. And I thought, well, we'll have to be moving it out of the way. I had to come back and add some more on so there might be something here to show you and I'll see if, this, if it's even still here. No, essentially it's gone too, and I put that on a month ago. You know, it's just like rotted away. You can't see it all. That was covered, and that there, which you don't want to open up right now because it smells real strong, but it's the waste from an organic um, juice juice bar, Medeas. I had it on that thick, and it's gone. You know, with the warmth, the moisture, and the cover crop over it, just eaten away. And the leaves and everything else, essentially gone. There's a few leaves here left, and that's it. But that's fine. You would have to find a way to remove this. You're not going to push any tool through this, right? And that could be a scythe or a flail mower or something like that. But once you remove that, you could then push seed in 
with any number of tools. That plant, you could, the one thing you wouldn't need to remove it with would be that planting pipe. You just shove it through, right? Maybe you don't shove it through. Maybe though you just kind of find your way through because it might kind of bind up otherwise. Push it into the soil, drop your seed, go to the next place, and then just let this sit here. And that depends on how late in the season you do that, how well that's going to work. This vetch will not die until it's going to seed and it gets hot. It's really hard to kill. But you're not going to have that problem because you're not going to use it. <laughs> Eliminate vetch from your no-till process. And that's a shame because vetch is a wonderful, it's listed in the uh, Managing Cover Crops Profitably and Downloadable SARE publication, which you can go online if you punch in SARE, S-A-R-E, uh, Sustainable Agriculture and Research and Education. You can download a whole book, which they're updating all the time, right, about cover crops. And in there, they say for our climate, vetch and rye are the king and queen of soil builders. They are, but too hard to kill. It also has extra floral nectaries, so it's feeding the beneficial insects all the time that it's out here. You know what? There are other great cover crops. You can use this someplace where you're not trying to do no-till or where you're in no hurry. Another problem with it is, in order for it to die, you have to let it go to seed or cut it somehow. If you let it go to seed, it makes seed of varying hardness, and it'll be coming back for the next 7 to 25 years. <laughs> you know? wow. It just keeps coming back. So I recommend staying away from it for these purposes. It's, if you're tilling in, it rocks. It totally is a wonderful cover crop, but it doesn't fit this. So that, we're going to find that all the time. As we evolve our methods, we also have to change our tools. And that's, you know, that's one of the things. When does it go to seed? Pardon? It, I mean, it's starting to flower now, and there's, there might even be a few pods, so it'll be finished seeding by probably mid-June, I'd say. Okay. You know, maybe a little late June, you know. Depends on how hot it gets. If it gets hot, it'll speed up, you know. It's, it's going to get it done, you know. And I'm also wondering, this thing is heavy enough, it might be crimping enough to kill a lot of it. I know it won't kill it all. But even our big fancy roller, we have a roller that you haul behind a 60-horsepower tractor, and it didn't even kill it, you know. I mean, it's just incredibly resilient, you know, which is not a bad thing, but in this situation, it is a tough thing. So I went to Lowe's and bought 30 some dollars worth of chain, came out here and tried to do it, and it bounced off this stuff. So I went into the shed and got another whole um, 30 some feet of chain and put that on there too. So this thing's got some weight. It's not a lot of, you know, I wouldn't recommend trying to do a large area in a hurry, you know. I recommend a bunch of breaks. But essentially what I do, I'll walk down here and show you. And come on down, try to walk, unless you're actually doing the, the, this part here, which I got anybody that wants to try, try to walk on the, on the plastic here, okay? And we'll show you what it can do. It, by the way, is utterly ineffective with things like dock, you know? That's just way too tough a plant. It's not designed to kill all weeds. It's designed to kill cover crops, you know? So you're gonna wanna come back after a lot of rain and yank that baby out, you know. It's really not gonna, not gonna go away without being removed by hand. But the cover crops will continually take up the space so you don't get a lot more of it. So cover crops are a way to deal with weeds, but these tools that kill cover crops won't necessarily kill weeds at all. Okay, so I come along and I go high first to knock it over. And see even there it bounces back, but now straight down, and it's starting to go. And once I got it started, I don't have to go high as much. So anybody want to try it? Nobody needs to, but we did say that you can actually try these tools. So anybody wants to be hands-on and try it, you're welcome to come forward. But I don't need you to at all. Don't feel obligated. It's heavy. Yeah, come on up. Come on down. Give it a try. It's pretty heavy. It looks heavy. Yeah, it's pretty heavy. Yeah. But for a small garden, you could just do as much as you can do if you're tired and then stop, you know. Yeah. Exactly. I'd say that's very true. Anybody else? I like to. Okay. A herd of teenagers is a fine thing. The problem is, 
The problem is that they do much more compaction than one person, and that tool doesn't do much compaction at all. You know, the ideal tool would allow you to do it. Maybe you could, from the, except for you want to knock the cover crop in one direction, and crosswise is probably not the direction you want it. You could come from the path and not be compacting at all. You know. No, it's for the weight. A, a good heavy piece of a heavy piece of you know made tool that had like a sharp edge, because that would crimp. You know, yeah. is that what you made? That's what I need them to make. Okay, good, <laughs> great. All right, so now you know, right? Yeah, I'll show when you get that made, you no, send the picture to us, and we'll post it. Yeah, yeah, and then if he wants a job, we can get him work. You know? He'll definitely make you one. Maybe, maybe okay. Two people could, yeah, there you go. Yeah, two people. Yeah. That's a thought. This person here, what's your name? Libby. Libby just said, what if you had two people? You could both be on a path, not walking in the bed, right? And come from each side, and that would make it a lot easier, you know? See, now, you'd want to back up and really cream that vetch that you passed by, because that's going to come right back, you know? Now, do you yeah. remove this after you break it down? No, no, you plant through it. You plant through it. And then it, that's where you use that planting stick, right? Okay. Or if you have any of the number of no-till cedars that we have, right. you know? Or you could come out here with a trowel or a shovel, slide through it, plant, you know? And then this is your mulch. You didn't have to haul mulch in. You didn't have to buy it. I mean, the cost of straw these days right. is not sustainable for anybody who's trying to do this to be saving money or making money. So you're saying this really isn't sufficient for the vetch? Um, it's not. I don't know. This is heavier than anything we've used. Maybe it'll kill the vetch, but I'll keep you posted, you know? So far, that the vetch is something that I've decided we're just not growing. And I, when I talked to Zev Freedom, he said, I just keep it out of my garden, you know? Cause, and that's such a shame because it's a great crop except for in no-till. Pardon? Snow chains aren't nearly heavy enough. You need much more weight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they literally would bounce off of that. I had a chain that was probably five times heavier than snow chains, and it literally just bounced off the rock. You know? I mean, which is hard to believe, but all that mass, and it's resilient and green, you know, and it just didn't happen, you know. Um, so, yeah. I used a screen trimmer this year. I had something like this, and I got it from Walnut Creek. Uh huh. Um, and it seemed to work. I mean, I just had it so that. Well, the truth is, a string a string trimmer in this kind of situation would be great because it doesn't matter if you're throwing it everywhere because you've got everywhere to throw it. Yeah. But if you've got a bed, a string trimmer doesn't work so very well. That's the only disadvantage where it throws it. String trimmer, trimmer, lawnmower, and rotary plow. Their problem is they don't drop it right where we want it. You know. Well, actually, there's another advantage. If you cannot chop it up. It doesn't rot as fast, and it covers the soil longer, and it actually does more like sheet composting. Yeah. We have a flail mower. We'll show you what that does. That's inferior to this. You know, it sure is a lot easier. And for some tools, it's necessary. You know, But for this situation, actually, if you don't chop it up, that's better. that's better. Now, actually, what we're talking about using a trimmer is we've got a field full of vetch, and we're going to roll it down, but then the vetch won't die. And we're thinking of coming with a trimmer and trimming a hole that'll kill the stuff right there and then planting in that. Mm -hmm. And then by the time it gets hot enough, it will die. And that, so using a, and actually I'd probably rather than a string trimmer, I'd take a blade, because it'll really come in and just a precise little hole, just zip out next place, zip out and make these holes that you plant in. Then you pull the cover crop back over. And by the time the, the um, crop is getting taller, the vetch is finally dead, you know? That doesn't mean that we've solved the seed forever problem, but we're stuck with that, you know? I mean. Um, yeah. Um, do you, do you have a buckwheat? Oh yeah, but buckwheat is not a summer a winter cover crop, you know. Buckwheat is a great crop. It doesn't give you nearly the um, volume, but mixed buckwheat mixed with cow peas, you know. Um, and we love buckwheat for so many reasons. I'll be singing the praises of buckwheat all day long. But you can use it at what time of year? Anytime, anytime just shy of last frost. It, it's about one tenth hardy. It can take the lightest of frost. You know, um, if you're willing to gamble. Otherwise, you wait till you're, you're sure there's no frost, and it will kill with the first significant frost. Anything that's like below 130, anything that's like 130, I mean 31 or lower, is going to kill it. There's a tiny chance of a frost, but I gamble because it can take the lightest of frost. Yeah, I'd go with it totally. And we'll talk about that more. But let's say you had this cover crop here, and you were going to mow it with the weed eater or a flail mower. We'd come in with that um, buckwheat and cow peas. And we'd seed it right into this whole mess. And then we'd come through and just like knock it all down on top of it. This would mulch the cover, the seed, nurse it. We do that, I'll show you. We do that on weeds everywhere. It's like 
that we've got that no-till part aced. I mean, we're just rocking with overseeding and chopping and dropping. We get spectacular results. And the mulch isn't too thick to allow the seeds to come up. No. Nah. They sprout it and they look at you know how they just look for light. You know, they find their way up to I'm sure some are delayed, but they still find their way up, you know. Um, we get wonderful seeding, you know. Um, so you could broadcast seed on a heavy mulch. Before you cut it. Before you cut it. Before oh. you cut it, yeah. If you put it on top, it's going nowhere. It can't get yeah, its roots oh, in the ground. That's what I was wondering. Yeah, no, no. You you drop it on top. And I don't know, we haven't tried without drilling it in. But actually, since the thickness of the mulch is the potential problem, can everybody hear me, by the way? OK. Since the thickness of the mulch is a potential problem, I can tell you that we are trying to eradicate this terrible weed called mugwort, which I'm not going to go into a lot of details right now. But if you want to know about it later, I'll tell you horror stories for a good couple hours. Um, anyways, we are getting massive cover crops, no-till drilling through masses of um, cover crop, and the seeds coming right up through it. And we also have at times um, just seeded over it and then rolled it down on top and it still came up through it. So I do know that this even here it works. But that is, there's one difference. That is cover crops that are all going one direction and aren't matted like this. This matted tangle might suppress seed for a little while. You might need to cut it or do something else. But since you're not going to make the mistake of, mistake of growing the vetch, you won't have to worry about that. You know? Um, a lot of caveats today are not going to matter if you just remember, don't grow the vetch if you want to do no-till. So what do you think, folks? Is that a tool worth using? Yeah, it's kind of fun. Yeah. Definitely. If you do it together, it makes it really easy, too. I see Tom cheating there. Yeah, I mean, a board, you know, you would have to step on it like that. And the, the problem with doing that is it is effective, but you are creating more compaction, you know? By stomping like that, even walking is some compaction, but your weight's distributed on top of the grass. But you've made this point now of pressure, and now you're stomping it in. So you are causing more compaction. But don't you want them to go down? You want them to go down, but you don't want to compact the soil below. Right. See, that's, the, that's why that, although it looks more effective, may not be as good, you know? It is more effective for sure, you know? Pardon? What is this right here, the tall grass? That's rye. That's, and the rye is easy to kill. We can knock that down and kill it. It's the vetch that's hard. And by the way, folks, that's a specific rye that we got to get fifth season to carry. Ren Abruzzi rye. You want to use Ren Abruzzi rye. And the reason why you want to use Ren Abruzzi rye is in this kind of a cool, we've had kind of a cool spring, right? Several blackberry winters, you know? Um, and the other rye would still be barely going to seed. And nothing is going to die until it goes to seed. Until the plants have their energy above the ground, if, they're, if it's all down on the roots, building up their head of steam to make seed, they're not dying. So the Renabruzzi rye doesn't go dormant. It grows in every bit of warm weather all winter long. And it's ready to kill, if you got the right tool, as early as mid-April. Whereas the other rye should be ready right now, but in a year like this probably wouldn't be. You know? This, this Abruzzi rye right now is very ready to kill. You know? And it's... Um, by the fact that it's making seed, you know, that's how, you know. Um, once they're making seed, they're doing what any plant does, all the energy goes to the future. Not worried about the past if it's an annual, right? So it's very easy because they're just like, they got nothing down below. You knock them over, crimp the ability for them to get more nutrients back to the roots and like, they're out of steam, you know. So that's, that's why we use the Rana Bruzy Rye. And, and Varieties and types of cover crops are real important, and I'll tell you everything I know about it. But when we got the slideshow, if it's, if it's raining, yeah. What about um, mustard as a co cover crop? Okay, what about mustard as a cover crop? Great question. I used to be totally disdainful of growing brassicas as cover crops because if you think about what we can grow here in the mountains, we grow a huge amount of brassicas, and they have diseases and pests. And I thought, why would I, you know, make my rotation even harder by growing them? Last year, I gave an all about brassica talk. When you do that, you figure you better go on and make sure you know, know everything you can about brassicas. And I'd forgotten that people grew brassicas as a fumigant to kill soil diseases. Basically, because usually we don't have a lot of soil diseases, though we have had a couple of bad ones recently because of all the wet. Now, I could, maybe I'll get time to talk about those, so it's kind of tangential. Anyway, I read that and realized 
we should be using brassicas to control the fusarium we got in our greenhouse. Now we got fusarium probably because we had massive production. You'll get to see a picture of how massive the production was. And we were distracted with a new farm and weren't using compost tea like we should have. Had we kept our soil diversity up, I don't think we would have gotten the fusarium. But we did. We got told by, by the extension pathologist we couldn't cure it organically. I said, I'm going to try compost tea and a biological called trichoderma, a fungus that eats funguses. One application and we stopped that disease dead. You know? But we still had it in the soil. I still had to worry about it. Though the truth is it's endemic. It's always in the soil. It's conditions that let it take over. By and large, I mean, you might be lucky and not have it in one spot, but the odds are very good it's there. So I realized the oilseed radish, also known as forage radish or tillage radish, is great for opening up the soil. And I just came in through and totally underseeded our tomato rows with oilseed radish and only a little bit of other stuff. They were thick with oilseed radish, which totally opens up the soil, makes big roots and opens the soil up, right? They die real easily. And probably the fumigating effect of those mustards are brassicas, right? The mustards will have a stronger fumigating effect probably, but the brassicas all have that same effect, has probably helped us to reduce the incidence of the fusarium. How did you time the planting of the radish with the planting of the tomatoes? It was, it was after the middle of August, and I came in under the tomatoes, which were reaching for the ceiling. They're on trellises, oh. and I just under sewed them. You know, I pulled fabric back or hay back, wherever it was, and just sewed them under and watered them in because we had dripped that berry, but that wasn't going to get them going. But they quickly, you know, watered them a few times, the roots were down to the drip, and then they just took over. By the time we took those tomatoes off, thick in radish growth, and then we had tops this high, all kinds of flowers feeding the beneficials of spring. If you enjoyed those radish pods, boy, we could have sold you tons, you know. I mean, we had huge, huge crop of it, you know. So I think that, yeah, for certain applications, brassicas are good. On the other hand, I'm going to talk more about David Brandt, who was a, partners with Ray Archuleta and has a company called Walnut Creek Seed, trying to get fifth season to carry those seeds. They're mixes of really diverse cover crops with all the right inoculants, which is great, because a lot of these inoculants are hard to find. You know? So they're seven bucks a pound, but for a small garden, it's a deal. You know? For a big farmer, no way. You know? um, but for a small garden, it's, it's the way to go. Anyway, we had his mix out here that included things like um, sesame, sunflowers. I'm talking about only the weird ones, not the common, you know, not the grain, summer grains and summer legumes, but the weird ones, right? And a certain kind of specific kale, which for the diversity and that fumigating effect would probably be good. But because we have such a harlequin bug problem, and we saw that the harlequin bugs were multiplying on that cover crop, and we can't even get to it without going through the whole cover crop, we told them this year, pull the, pull the brassicas. No brassicas for our summer cover crops because of the harlequin bug problem. We'll grow our brassicas in the winter, but not in the summer. You know, So it's always like, you know, how you tweak it. And if you're buying their pre-made mixes, you're not going to get that choice. But if enough people in this area ask them to make a Western North Carolina mix, I bet they would. You know. Any other questions before we head back inside? Yes. Have you tried growing cowpeas amongst the oh. tomatoes or squash? Yeah, I mentioned them a bunch of times. I do, but I grow them late. But it's more vigorous, so you would want to wait until the... Until the plants are way ahead, and you still have to kind of pull them down some. But the thing that a lot of people don't know about cowpeas is the leaves are edible. Yeah. So where they're being a problem, just come in and harvest them. You know, there's a vine going up a tomato, cut the whole vine off, take it inside, have it for dinner. You know, it's you're not going to hurt the plant. Southern peas the same as cow peas? Pretty much. Pretty similar, yeah. Yeah, they're all very similar, yeah. Um, they all have those skinny pods and black-eyed peas, all those guys are, you know, pretty interchangeable. Any other questions? Okay, let's head in. You talked about it actually, moving away from the linoleum. <laughs> Uh -huh. You're talking about like, like black plastic or something like that. Yeah, it was well, it was cardboard and leaves. Yeah. But black plastic is and, the same thing, you know. And the reason I love you quoting Trescott. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's just, just but it dates us too, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> and the reason to not do that is that it kills all the critters. No, it's just that it's not as dynamic. It doesn't kill all the critters, but it's uh, the critters that don't do as well with, without as much oxygen aren't going to do as well, you know. Mm -hmm. But the plants, why would you miss the chance to have these, the sun pouring all this energy in, you know? So you, and sometimes. You don't have time to try and carefully get rid of something like mugwort. The best thing to do is linoleum. It's not never use that yeah, tool, just, but don't you, don't get you carried lose away an with it. Yeah, yeah. Too much. There was a year. I mean, when I got there, it turned out that all that wonderful leaf mold from the cemetery was filled with nuts, sedge, and mugwort. And so we, you know, the garden had been inoculated; it was everywhere, you know. And labor-wise, we couldn't deal with it. Now I'll talk about how we did eventually solve the problem. It was some other cropping, but I just said to Carrie, "Let me go to Asheville Waste Paper and get two pallets of um, paper." I learned how heavy paper was. <laughs> that, F, that 350 was like riding high in the end with those two pallets. Oh, wow. We just laid that, we laid down pallet 
liners from, from American Can Company. Does this come out of the garden? Yeah, and it'll go to the compost pile eventually. Um, we laid it down everywhere and put leaves on top of it. The garden was, linole was linoleum. But so, that was the year that I went to the talk and saw Elaine Ingham and came back and I took it all up. <laughs> you know? What would you, how would you have done it differently now? Smother crops. In that same situation. I do smother crops, yeah. Maybe there'd be some. Okay, a quick answer um, to anybody that's interested. This is called cup plant. It's a great forage plant, high protein, makes runners. The American Indians use it as an herb for all kinds of stomach aid, you know, problems and nausea. And why it's called cup plant is you can see it cups and holds water for beneficial insects. It is, and it's a composite with millions of flowers in the springtime, in the summertime. It is a wonderful rocking plant, you know. And we'll have seeds later on. Anybody that wants to can have them. It is a perennial that spreads slowly. It's a wonderful concept for steep banks where you're going to do animals and stuff because it's high grade forage that comes back. Meanwhile, it's also feeding the beneficials. And actually out there, there was one spot where it looked like I didn't roll, roll it down properly. It was to go around two volunteer cup plants. Pat, yeah. can I disturb you for half a second? I'm John Morris. So Oh, yes, thank you. Happy you made it. Thank you. Becky's here with me. She's a retired engineer also. This okay. Is Pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much for coming. Um, so, uh, well, we just arrived, mm -hmm. and I was looking at your rolled beds over on mm -hmm. the far side, mm -hmm. and so that's what we're talking about. No, well, I was going to put you in the greenhouse. I think we had too much rain last night for you to work out there. Oh. Yeah. You can go look in the greenhouse. It's flail mode. I don't think you'll have any problem getting through it. Ah, okay. Controlled moisture, you know. Well, I didn't know if I should unload now out there. Or sure. At what time would you? Well, you wanted to start at four, right? Well, roughly, whatever. Yeah. How, how does it work for you? As, as usual, I worried that we have enough stuff to talk about, and I can see now I won't have enough time. So we'll just stop and let you do it, and we'll fit all we can in. We're going know? towards it. So I should go ahead and unload now yeah. and so yeah. forth, and then and we'll you can come back in. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Is that, is that okay. good? Yeah. Okay. And I'll introduce you right now, since you're here. This is John Morrison and Becky Cummings. Cummings. They were kind enough to come from Unicoi or from yeah. Raleigh or from Unicoi. Johnson, Unicoi. Johnson City, basically. Johnson City with a brand new, a relatively brand new walk behind no till cedar, which is real thrilling. Um, and they're going to demonstrate it here. We're really lucky to have them here. Thank so you. that'll happen Thank sometime you. around four or after four. Thank you. I need a cup of water here. I wouldn't have that title if it wasn't for my IT expert and intern of the moment, Mark. <laughs> I am so grateful to him. <laughs> I, I let him tell the hilarious stories of how good I am with a computer. Um, anyway, before I start, I want to say that when I conceived this class, I really was a little evangelical. I was kind of like, no till is the future. Nowhere in nature, and I mean, if you've been to our talks, you've probably heard me say this, nowhere in nature do we, is the soil disturbed in order for it to be fertile, right? But then this spring, because we're having, and I highly recommend this workshop, Jeff Poppin, Craig Siska, and Amy Hamilton coming out and teaching biodynamics. And I, I wanted all those people, we all wanted those people, because all those people do biodynamics in a way that's accessible to anybody. You don't have to know all the theory. You don't have to go off into the stars with Steiner. It's just really good practical stuff that helps you to grow very well. And why I really wanted them, why biodynamics has been on my radar for 20 years or so, is I've seen biodynamics more successful at controlling some of our really intractable diseases like late blight and downy mildew than any other method. Yet science will tell you it doesn't work. You know, it's, there's no scientific basis. You know, and what they really mean is it's way too complex for us to study it, so therefore it's not scientific. You know? Um, but I had him come for that. This is kind of a little ad for him. I highly recommend that workshop. It's going to be two days. Jeff's going to be by himself on Saturday. Then Amy and Craig are going to come the next day. I figured I'd better go see him and see what he was going to have. And I'm really glad I did because I still have to talk and make sure that we get the most of what he has to offer, which will cover biodynamics, but a load of it is about his philosophy of old-timey farming. Very low capital. Lots of land, lots of animals, yet he can kind of make it, the, can help you jam on how to make that work on a smaller scale. Though really his heart's in big, he wants to get lots of young people farming large amounts of land and growing lots of food and doing it at very low cost. He uses lots of tractors. They're all tractors you can pick up for like $2,000, $3,000. He's got no expensive equipment. 
He has all old timey equipment. He dust mulches. In other words, he works the soil after every rain event, as soon as it's dry, creating a fluffy layer of dust. He doesn't do any irrigation at all. He grows 100,000 pounds of vegetables a year with three other workers. Okay. Um, just incredible systems. And he, he does soil cultivation. He uses a subsoiler to rip the soil in one direction. The first time he does it, he, sp he spreads lots of manure that he's composted in a way that I would have judged as like not at all good in the past. But I'm learning to let go of my judgment and realize there's many ways to do things. right? He uses biodynamic preps, which totally changes that compost. I believe that's true. right? And they'll teach you how to make those preps. He lays that compost out, then he rips with a, with a subsoiler. The compost drops in pretty deep, some of it does. He then sits back and lets the biology work for several days. When he comes back again, he goes in the same direction with the subsoiler, and now that subsoiler has incredible impact because the biology has loosened the soil. And his whole point is to make the soil fluffy so that there's an interaction between the air and the soil. Because we probably all know, or maybe we don't, I didn't know it at one point, the air is much more nitrogen than it is oxygen by a whole lot. But that oxygen is not normally available to plants. His theory, and science would probably dispute this, but it's working for him, is that he, using biodynamic preps, gets the right kind of life so that that fluffed up soil with the oxygen penetrating accesses that nitrogen. He uses, very, he uses cover crops and that compost and that's it. And when I look at that system, I realize that for beginning growers, if they got to inherit a family farm, or they had some other way that they had access to the land, right? If they're willing to work with animals, that they could actually afford to do that really quickly. Whereas the kind of stuff I'm talking about, the equipment, you know, the no-till drills, fourteen to twenty thousand dollars. The roller, I think it's three to six. You know, much more expensive. You know, not as accessible. And then you still have to do irrigation. The fact that he does this without irrigation is very impressive. So I have to go. I'm still promoting the no-till. I see that as the future in many ways, especially for small growers. But I have to accept that there's this other way, and it has a whole lot of validity. And indeed, if he really is getting that oxygen to get into the, I mean, the nitrogen to get into the soil from the air, we got to look at that. You know? So had I not gone to that workshop, you would have never heard this part. But it just reminds me that there isn't any one way. You know, Toon was asking me a bunch of questions about the linoleum and why it was wrong. It's not wrong. There may be times when doing that kind of mulching is the right way to go. But you have to make those decisions. You learn all the tools and you apply the ones that work best for you at the moment. You know? And so with that caveat, we'll start this. And Mark, do I just hit the button or something? Or? We have a you have a clicker? We have a right there for you. Yes. Is this it? Yep. Cool. Yep. OK. All right. So I just hit the center one, right? OK. And I am really bad at all this stuff. Yeah. Okay. Okay, back. Okay. All right, cool. All right. Okay. So and there's a red pointer. If you go to the button, it'll point at Okay. Oh, I'll worry about that when I where's the button? Oh, it's the middle. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm holding that one down. All right. I don't see it, but I believe you. Okay. All right. Okay. Anyway, we'll see if we can use that. So this is the way we used to do it, right? Wonderful cover crop, till it all in, plant the plants. Those plants are gonna really do wonderfully. They're going to boom. Lots of oxygen, lots of green material, which is loads of sugars, right? Plenty of organic matter. The thing is, that life is just going to go to town on all that cover crop, and you're going to get lots of growth and very little long term impact. You know? Once I figured that out, and it was probably the late 90s, I gave a talk that was something like three steps forward, three and a quarter back. Because I would haul in loads of compost put tons of cover crop on, and then double dig my beds. You know, I was young and stupid. You know, <laughs> had lots of energy. And, or younger and stupider. Anyway, that w meant that I had all this oxygen in and all this organic matter and things went crazy. All the metabolic byproducts of all that life meant that the plants boom. They love all that stuff, right? But I was trying to improve clay and it never got any better. You know, and Diane still complains about that clay wants to only perennials there. I think if we instead we're laying down the cover crop and letting it drop. The action of the fungi and the slow interaction, not losing all that energy that goes to the plants, and a lot of it goes up in the air, would slowly begin to build organic matter, and that's what improves the clay. So the old way works, totally. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's not progress. Okay? 
Slowly it is, I'm sure, but it's much, much slower. So if you want major progress, you want your soil organic matter to stay there, not get eaten up right away. You don't want to favor the bacteria. Okay? You want a good balance between bacteria and fungi. And the fungi like that stuff when it turns brown and the bacteria can't access it anymore and they slowly break it down. Okay? Not that the that it's not getting eaten by um, pill bugs or sow bugs or whatever you want to call them or taken into furrows by worms. So some of it is going in the ground and getting worked in. But it's not at that huge rate that our artificial power tiller or whatever it has. Okay? So that's why we're moving away from that. It's not bad. Those plants look good, right? There's nothing wrong with those plants at all. And there's nothing wrong with that system. It worked for a long time. I made plenty of money doing it. We grew lots of vegetables for Highland Lake Inn doing it. Um, but it's not the only way. All right. This is the Highland Lake Inn. Early experimentation down towards the lake where we just cut stuff and dropped it into the bed. You know, we did it by, you know, we basically just came through and weed ate it or mowed it with a mower and then raked it over into the bed. You know, and so that's the next step, beginning to figure out. No tools, no figuring it out, just like slowly figuring, you know, slowly just playing with it. This is me and at Sparkling Earth Farm, similar thing, just like chop, rake in, drop, and that's it. Okay, just the beginning of figuring it out. Okay. This now is mountain air, where by the time I got here, I was sold on this. You know, I'd been learning it for a while, and now I was convinced. And this was backfill. This basically is on the side of a mountain, big rock wall. They just put rubble in there. You know, rubble and then whatever, you know, subsoil they could get. Really nasty soil. Came in, rented a friend's spader. I didn't own a spader then myself. Spading machine, 10 years ago, I would have said that's the tool, the tillage tool of the future. Now I tend to say tillage doesn't have a future. But maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> Jeff may say, you know, that it does. But, you know, I own a spading machine. I can't conceive of using it now. But um, we did spade that once. And that, by the way, for all my talk about no-till, if you're coming into a brand new place and don't have all the time in the world, you might want to work the soil once to get it so you can shape your beds and so that you don't break your back trying to get into really hard soil. If you had a few years, you wouldn't need to do that. You could use plants and seeds and microbes to do it. But most of us don't have that time, usually. So a one time working with the least disturbance possible, you know, on the order of tools to you, right, use, right? Disc, one of the worst. Plow, a little better but not great, right? Tiller actually is way up there for really bad, you know? Subsoiler, like Jeff Poppin uses, way better, you know? Um, spader, about as good as you can get for tillage, you know, but not easy to come by. You know, they're not, it's not a common tool. Yes, Mark? What about a harrow? Power a power harrow is, is way better than, than a tiller. Yeah, it's, it's not working as much of the soil. Right. Yeah. The, the yeah. But there's also a rotary plow, and what that's great for is like building beds, but well, you're working a soil, a soil a lot when you're doing it, you know. But one time, you know, all of this can be repaired. Nothing is final, right? The dynamism of nature is incredible. You can fix whatever damage you do. Try to do as little as possible so you don't have to fix so much and you can start gaining on it, right? But don't be intimidated. I, I say to everybody all the time, you finish this talk, you go home, you have your tiller, you can't figure out how to do this. You don't grow this year because you can't figure out how to do it. Wrong idea. Pull the tiller out and garden. It's way better than buying food from California, right? There's plenty of things you can do after you till. So there isn't any, like, you've got to do it this way. It's just what tools do we have? Where can we start? At what point can we get in? And how can we keep doing the best practices? Okay? Anyway, after we did that one spading, which we grew a cover crop first before we spaded it, and we bought a bunch of compost to put it down, no bed in here got worked. Now, maybe an occasional spot got worked for carrots or something because people wanted it worked up nicely but only like a spot here and there. Essentially what we did here, and I'll show you with the next slide hopefully, was grow cover crops. And I don't know if you can tell, but there's leaves. This is a very expensive, very fancy retreat or um, uh, development, you know, golf course, airport, highest golf course, highest airport on the East Coast. And they, of course, collect everybody's leaves. We had access to huge amounts of leaves. So they would just come down and blow out chopped leaves, the best thing in the world, right? Chopped up leaves, and they would blow out yards and yards and yards. We'd have these huge piles. And then we rented various machines, came in, 
and stuffed as many leaves as we could into the pats and pass and packed them down. Just got to, and then packed them on the edges where the weeds wanted to come in. Just, we just jammed leaves in there. We, it would be a two-day job in December where we just stockpiled huge amounts of leaves. Before we did that, we took last year's leaves, right? Before we put the cover crop on and scattered it on the bed, then we put the seed cover crop in and grew it. So we were quickly putting loads of organic matter in the soil. Now comes springtime, we come in, and I said I, I killed two hedge trimmers, right? I tried a weed eater, I used a scythe, I used shears. I just, every tool I could think of to cut these cover crops, chopped them, and then took the leaves out of the path and buried them. And I do that sometime in late March. And by the time most of the gardeners got there, now I had a few that I had to struggle with that got there early, sometime in April, but most got there right around May. I could pull that mulch back and that cover crop was basically dead. There might be some dried out stems or something, but by and large, I could just plant. So that was the way that we did it, you know? Um, and there might be a real cold, dry spring and then it wouldn't be as dead. So once again, no formulas. Nature's always gonna throw you a few curveballs. You have to come up with different plans when that happens. And so maybe then for an early crop, we had to actually pull the stuff out or work the soil a little bit. But by and large, no tillage, just cut the cover crop, bury it, and go on. And that's how we did no till there all the time. And that's a very viable way for a home garden. No particular equipment at all. Any tool will cut it, you know. Um, and that's just more, you can see the cover crops, it's the back of the garden, and that's just the history there. That's where I, I really got into essentially no till. You know, it was no till labor intensive. This is not a small farm method. You know, you're going to take too long, you know. This is a backyard gardener or maybe small time, very intensive market gardener method. It's not really going to be profitable if you have a lot of area. Okay. All right. By the time we're here, this is, I think, 2013 when this greenhouse first went up. This is our new greenhouse, kind of a flagship greenhouse next to our biochar plant, built to use the heat from the biochar plant. Um, but in the building, our builder was kind of absent when they should have been present and allowed the person laying the pad out to not level it. Which, given that we wanted to put heating um, stuff in the soil, was a disaster. We had a grade that was like, 18 inches off. It really doesn't work at all, you know. So we had to come back in and fix it, which was lots of machines and lots of compaction. Okay. The soil that was originally in there was the subsoil that was left from them having removed a, a hill. So it was sub-subsoil, very sandy subsoil. The lowest um, cation exchange capacity I'd ever seen, I think it was like two or something like that. Cation exchange capacity, for those that don't know, is a way to measure the ability of plants to hold basic minerals and make them available. Minerals like calcium, potassium, uh, magnesium. Okay, so it's a measure of fertility. And it was absolutely terrible there. Okay. We did a few things. We made, we bought biochar, we weren't making it then. We inoculated that with compost tea. We put 5% biochar into compost that we had. And we also got, we were lucky to get given 20 truckloads of pond muck that was 8% organic matter. A wonderful gift. We're still hoarding it and just look at it like we're rich. Okay. We added 37, excuse me, 37% pond muck to um, the 5% amended compost. And each 80 foot bed by about 30 inches wide got two thirds of a yard, which is essentially two wheelbarrows of, um, maybe it's three wheelbarrows. I think it's three. It should be 27 cubic feet. Those wheelbarrows are six. So it's three wheelbarrows of that 5% organic, or, I mean, biochar inoculated compost, okay? We then came in and planted tillage crops, okay? Crops that would go down deep and do the tillage that we don't want to do with machines, okay? And also, of course, be putting all those exudates out and doing all the other dynamic things. So what we planted were rye, which goes really deep and helps to work the soil, okay? Oil seed radish, like daikon, they can get that big, that long. Of course, when they rot, there's a hole left and all that soil falls in. Now it's nice and soft, it's not compacted, right? It's also doing the fumigating that we talked about, right? We also planted a plant that I dearly love, and you'll see a few more times, called Facilia tanacetifolium, or folia. I never can remember if it's got the A or the M. Uh, uh, folia, thank you for remembering. I took too much Latin, you know, um, and did not learn any of it. Um, except for the word agricolae, which is farm. <laughs> um, I don't know why, but that word appealed to me. Anyway. Um, 
It is in the same family as borage and comfrey. They're all bioaccumulators. They go deep and pull up all kinds of nutrition. Unlike bor like comfrey, it's not a perennial. Okay? It's more like borage. Um, it's very dynamic. Turns out when Dr. Elaine Ingham was at a workshop we did at the Highland Lake Inn years ago, we were growing it, and she said, that plant, although it's not a legume, fixes nitrogen. So even though it's not a legume, it fixes nitrogen. In Europe, they grow huge amounts of it because they think the exudates are so good for diversity for feeding the soil. People who are knowledgeable about it tell you oh, it's a spectacular bee forage plant. They say, be careful even. It may, if it's in bloom, pull the bees away from other crops you're trying to pollinate. It's that attractive to them. Um, so we put that in there. I think that was it. I think those are the three crops. And you can see it's doing very well. Okay? Once we did that, when we came in and planted it, we did a soil test. And we had a cation exchange capacity of 21 or 22. I couldn't find the, the information. My friend John Nielsen has all the right reference books. He pulled off an old USDA handbook and looked it up. Native prairie soils range between 25 and 27, I think. So we are right below native prairie soil and fertility. Some of that's gone. Some of that was the immediate flush of the compost, but it's still in the high teens at least. Okay? Um, and we never have tilled that soil. We basically built that soil. We never tilled it at all. We just kind of piled up soil on top of the subsoil. We mixed, by the way, that 37% pond soil with the subsoil and then added in the compost, and that's how we made that bed, those beds. We've had spectacular pr production because of that, and we don't seem to have any compaction problems at all. It seems to not be a problem. So to me, that's the wave of the future is to use those kind of crops. Um, and we'll talk more about them, because I tried a similar mix out here that was supposed to winter kill, and it did not. Yes, Mark? So you just laid that down, or you chopped it? Um, yes, we, we, we flail mowed that. We didn't have a roller by then. We flail mowed it, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> it would eventually die, but probably not when I wanted to, you know. Um, this was planted in the, this actually was planted late. This was planted probably in January, because that's when we finally had the bed ready. And it still did that well by spring. But normally you would plant that in September or October or November or December, any of those times, depending on, greenhouse you might plant later because your other crop can go longer, but you can under sow, so it could have been there anyways. You know, and it could have been growing. You could have undersown that in September, and it would be growing all that time. Yes, Christine? Well, you mentioned pond mulch. How do you harvest that? You know? Well, they basically, this person who I had done a lot of free consulting for, because they'd been kind to me in other ways, wanted to pay me back, and he was having a pond renovated. He needed a place for it to be dumped. It gets harvested with big machines, you know. But I actually learned my lesson, because... Somebody heard that we took it, and they were going to do another lake nearby here, and they asked if we'd take it, and I was way too eager. He never called me back. I'm sure he found somebody to buy it, you know? You have to learn to play coy with that, you know? It's like, oh, yeah, I guess I could take that. It would be a little trouble. It's like, can you help with the shipping, you know? <laughs> yeah. I was like, yes, we'll definitely take it. When can we get it? You know? It's like I never heard from him again, you know? He realized I got to have a commodity here, you know? So next time somebody offers me that, I'm going to be like, yeah, I'll try, you know? <laughs> yes, right? It's Facilia tanacetifolium, also known as tansy leaf facilia, and rye. Okay. Yeah. And what was that rye type again? Like? is what we normally grew. I don't think we knew about Renabruzzi then, though. I think that was just plain old ordinary rye. Um, but it kills easier in a greenhouse because it gets hot. All these plants are hard to kill. The hotter it gets, the easier it is to kill them. They're all cool season plants. Okay. Okay. That's the oilseed radish where I said I planted it for the tomatoes in bloom. Okay? It's going to be very easy to kill, lots of biomass when we kill it. I don't know if I have a shot of it. It looks really messy because they're big stalks. They chopped up kind of messy. But right now, it is feeding the beneficial insects spectacularly. We're getting a huge jump on biodiversity by having all those flowers. You know? This was probably early April that that was time to mow it and kill it. You know? And of course, had we wanted to, we could have come through and harvest large numbers of oil of oilseed radish seed pods, which would be very tender, juicy radish, kind of little hot, little sweet tasting vegetables. But we didn't take the time to do that. We just kind of took it out. There's another shot of that cover crop, same cover crop. It just did spectacularly. It just had everything it needed and got us off to an amazing start. Um, here, we really were on our way. We, had, we weren't tilling, right? Um, we flail mode. 
came in, planted, but we didn't save the residue, so we had to haul in straw to cover to mulch the plants. Now, if we rolled, we'd separate it, plant through, and not have to haul in straw. So we're part way there at this stage, but we're not all the way there. Patrick, yes. Um, are, where did you get the straw? We actually were lucky enough to know when Jason Davis, a local farmer, was doing his one-time experiment with wheat, and we bought a lot of straw. But it's not easy to come by. You just got to ask around, look for a farmer. Rye straw or barley straw are more likely to be gotten. You know? uh, my concern is that so much of the straw that's available where we're at may have been uh, no-till farming with oh, the, glyphosates. Well, glyphosate is one problem. That, that's a problem for sure, but there's an even bigger problem, which is this whole class of pesticides that if you use them, herbicides, you can have basically a toxic effect on many crops, including tomatoes, for many, many years. You can find out about which one those are, which ones those are by contacting, um, by getting, going to Janine, Dr. Janine Davis's website. Okay, so these crops here are all growing on the top of cover crops that we rolled. And they're doing very well, you know. Now we did actually come back for some of them and put plastic over them, you know, just because we didn't want to take a chance on weeds coming back up. And we also wanted the heat for the cover crop, you know. So not plastic, we use fabric which has the ability to breathe, you know. So we did a, a hybrid, and you can do that, you know. You could come through, knock your cover crop down, oh, I don't know if the peas all died, but they're hurt, right? Pull some black fabric over it, they're pretty much done, you know. Um, it's not that easy to drive staples through that much bulk, though, I'll tell you, you know. I mean, what's wiser is to maybe, where you planted your peppers, you have some bare soil and stretch your fabric to there and then staple it down there, and then you got this weird kind of bulky looking, ugly thing, but Eventually it rots down and looks nice and neat, you know, within about a half a season. Okay, massive yields from these things. I mean, Meredith, did we ever get a count on the, on the cucumbers? How many pounds came from that row? I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. Yeah, I really want to get that figure because I think I can claim 3,000 pounds. I think we probably have hit 3,000 pounds from one 80-foot row of cucumbers. Just incredible yields, and we'll see a picture of what the tomatoes are doing eventually here. Okay, that's just more examples of that incredible fertility. These are tomatoes, Mountain Fresh Plus. Marshall is a commercial grower who grows with us. It's the most widely grown tomato on the, on the East Coast. He likes growing them on stakes. He couldn't believe how good the production was one year. The next year he tracked it. I think it was 26 and a half pounds per plant. And that's like, he said, the very best conventional grower on what they call virgin land, which is land that's been in cows for years and years, with a cube of chemicals per acre, I think, per week, gets those kind of yields. Compost tea, once a week, you know, two tablespoons to the gallon was the most this got, and it didn't get it every week, right? He then did it again last year, and I think he was like, I think I did the last figures, or he did one more to me. We were pushing 30 pounds to the acre, or maybe, I mean, 30 pounds to the plant, or maybe 31, 32. Incredible yields. Um, because of no-till, compost tea, biochar, all these things combined together, super fertility. That's an example. That's, you know how you get clusters of tomatoes? There's 10 of them there. They're all full size. You know? I think I mentioned, because we weren't keeping the microbial diversity up, those tomatoes did get fusarium. You just can't put that much fruit out without weakening. You know, I said earlier, right, the plant's going to put its energy into making seed. So if it's making that much seed, it's not doing a lot of defense down at the root section. It doesn't have as much exudates to feed the bacteria that we know keep the fusarium away. But all we had to do was get wise, start doing compost tea again, use an antagonistic fungi, and we solved the problem. And then to be sure, we grew all those little seed radishes that you just saw so that we fumigated that fusarium and knocked it back into its quiescent stage. It's always there, but now it's asleep, and it doesn't have an opportunity because we keep our diversity up and keep it controlled. And I guarantee you, plenty of scientists go, he can't prove that. He's talking out of his head, you know? Nope. I'm an organic farmer. What I have to say to them is, you won't test these kind of tests because they're way too complex. It works for us. Get out of our way, you know? I don't care if you think it's scientific or not. I'm going to pass the information on that I get from observation. We wouldn't have the theory of evolution if it wasn't for observation. You don't have to do replicated tests of everything to say something that has some validity. Excuse me. That's a... That's a bully pulpit that I can't resist, you know? Amen. <laughs> Thank you, sister. <laughs> okay, rolled cover crop, you know? The truth is, 
There's vetch in there and crimson clover. It didn't die too well. We struggled with it, but we made it work. Yep. This is, should be Rocco using our roller. Go ahead, Rocco. Yeah, well, this is not, this is not Lisa quality. She never had her hands on this. <laughs> this is my, my smartphone, or my outsmart me phone. You notice he has the handlebars off to the side so he's not walking on the bed. Okay. All right. Okay, now we're doing, this is the ATV one, I think. Pardon? Okay, it's about a minute into the ATV thing. Now he's just commenting about the last one. Can you even hear that? Yeah. Okay. Oh, beautiful. Beautiful. That's a chevron pattern. And what it's actually doing is it's actually breaking the uh, the base of these uh, yeah, how did we miss me? Where did where'd I go? <laughs> if we all right, so here comes round two. Now it's set. Right. Now it's set. Okay, now you're gonna see it. And that probably won't lay down as well, but that's not so much of an issue because you know the crimper in design for perennial grasses is still designed for these annual cover crops. Uh, so we can terminate those in a different way. So here he comes again. Look out, Karina. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Beautiful. That's a shovel. Pardon? Oh, totally. That's what I said. Yeah. The heck with the walk behind. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. The base of these plants, right at that soil level, is actually Great. Looks great. Yeah. Yeah, you can stop it there now. Yeah, I will because it's pretty. It'll come back. And it did indeed. That was that weedy bed I said that the eight didn't do a very good job at all because there were so many weeds in there, you know? Okay, so now we're going to see the gorilla. Oh, but actually, well, we'll see another picture of that. That's the facilia knocked down, and I thought that would crimp and die. I don't know if you noticed, but it's kind of tipping its head up and growing again. It didn't crimp. It got knocked over, but it did not crimp. Okay, so we just moved. Pardon? Did you go too fast? And the roller. They say to go fast. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't know. We're learning. Yeah. Mostly, I think it was just things that don't die easy. Yeah. Rolling will help the crimping. Rocco and I are pretty convinced that that rye is finished. It's not going to come back. That's yeah. true. The rye is finished. Yeah. This is, you get a special treat yeah, here. That's it, boy. We just did it. See where that breaks? That first break is, and we're going to hold another one. See, that's called crimping right there. Yeah. So it's that actual break that. Yeah, it's sure the cover crop won't come back. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, it could just let Karina walk through the garden, and he, she probably will kill everything too, don't you think? <laughs> And kudos to Rocco. He was there on his off time helping me out so we could do this. I swerved a little bit there to avoid the barley. We want to use that barley for another workshop. We're going to crush that barley. Um, this, by the way, is the bed that I had hoped would all winter kill. And unfortunately, although a lot of the facelia and the oilseed radish winter killed, the barley looked dead but came back. It's spring barley, also known as robust barley. 
and I fully expect it to die. It's never lived through the winter for me before. But this year, because I was counting on it, it came back. Anyway, you can see, pretty darn good kill. The barley got hit a little bit, but we'll still get a harvest so we can practice threshing for our August grain class. And we're gonna use the grillo and the same roller to take this next bed of rye. All right, that's it. Um, I'm pretty satisfied with the way the ATV and roller work. That did a pretty darn good job of knocking it down. So you don't have to have a grill up, you got an ATV, you can get yourself a roller, and you're in business. Or make so a roller. Doesn't know it is a walk behind tractor. It is not a way to cook steak. Okay. I'm happy to have you be the narrator. Okay. So, we just... Yeah, if it'll play easy, let Rocco talk about the... Or maybe he already did that one. down a little bit faster and uh, excuse me so it breaks down the biomass breaks down slower as opposed to slow mowing for example uh, but that will allow us to plant vegetables in this summertime vegetables in this and uh, have an existing mulch and have all this beneficial biomass feeding the soil pennsylvania soldier beetle and is that thing you see there um, impacting our beneficials as we do this but i think because we're crimping most of them will survive unless they're very unlucky that's a Pennsylvania soldier beetle right now, about to see its world a little bit disturbed. All right. Come on, Karina. We're gonna go very fast. That's gonna dry down here. It's standing in the shade. I'm not sure we need to watch this. I think it's the same thing we already saw, actually. Right. Are you all dying to see me come down the road again? <laughs> <laughs> With the purple flower, the pansy? Yep. Okay. Yeah. And it's just covered up with beneficials. Obviously, most of them probably did fine, you know? Yeah, Tom. Yeah, you said that the, um, the Grillo did a better job of crimping than the ATV. I think that there was more weight on the Grillo. Well, that's because they, the David Brandt says that's the best way to get killed, to go pretty fast. I was, I was going in first gear. I was going very slowly. But it was much heavier in general. The whole, you know, it's, the, the ATV kind of is just like, I think I probably should go some slower because the ATV is probably like, that thing's probably flying at times, like getting, going airbound, you know? So I probably was going too fast. But that's learning because David Brandt said you want a good clip, you get a better kill that way, which I can imagine if it's the right clip, you know? The grill. Oh yeah, it had maximum weight. Yeah, yeah. It's, it comes at about Meredith and I could testify to its weight, and <laughs> we took it out of our car. <laughs> That's a story to tell. Um, and um, we then put, I think, probably 200 pounds. It, was, it came in at 300 pounds with 200 pounds of bell bar weights on it, so it weighs about 500 pounds. You know, so there's a lot of weight there. But I mean, really, a lot of why the other one didn't kill is because there's so many weeds. Same crimp around both machines, yeah. We only have one. Yeah. 1300 bucks or so, we only got one. But really, those other weeds and stuff are kind of protecting because they don't crimp down as well. So the things around them, and really, if you look out there, most of the barley did get killed. It was the things. Earth Tools has a, a roller that's a lot cheaper than that. Well, they, we got this from them. For our grill, they had to make it. You know? Maybe by now they have one that's being made. We got this two years ago. You know? But that's the price of trying to you know, figure things out ahead of time. You know? um, it's way worth it. Okay. This is one of my favorite videos. Can you? 
We went over crimped in the greenhouse rockily, you saw, right? After we were done, out popped the toads from where we had just crimped. And that's important. We want to kill that crop but not compact our soil, right? He didn't do this cute little hop. No. <laughs> Usually he then hops off into the path, you know, you know, oh he's doing fine. But he's kind of looking at you like, what did you guys just do to me? You know? <laughs> yes. A question where? When you knock the when you knock it down, it's kind of like the one that you said did better over there with the crimping. Yeah. Um, when do you when do you lay out your bed as far as irrigation and stuff? Um you would Ideally, have buried your irrigation in that bed and just leave it in there. And eventually, you would have a problem if some mouse would come and chew in it underground, but mostly it would survive fi fine. You know? I wouldn't try and put irrigation. If you wanted to put irrigation in a bed after you lay it down, you'd have to thread it through there or separate it, which you could do, but it'd be a lot more work. You know? so, yeah, you will get a lot of evaporation. A lot of that water is going to be you know, hitting that grass and going up rather than getting down in. So it depends on how much water you have. You know? but, if you laid it down, if you laid it down even on the top before you grew the cover crop, the roller crimper wouldn't hurt it at all. You could roll right over it. The fittings, you'll break them, you know. So the fittings can't be on there. You got to take them off before you roll. But the tape is not going to be hurt by that roller crimper. But I think you want it down before your crop gets big. Otherwise, I think you're going to think it's a real pain. And the downside of that is it can get gnawed on, you know. But maybe come up with some real bitter thing you can put on it that makes it less appealing, you know. Um, and I'd run that on the inside because the UV would take it out, but maybe a little bit of neem even. Neem is really bitter and an anti feedant and if you ran a little bit of neem through those tapes in the fall, probably one bite would be like all they'd take and they wouldn't come back, you know. And one bite, that much of a leak, you know, depends on how many things did one bite though. I mean, you just have to figure that out. We have, we have had it laying out and we've turned the drip on and it's been fine, but I can't guarantee that, you know. Um, any other questions? Okay. This is how it survived. This is what they do. They make these little holes. And so it was in there. But if we had used some tool that was more disturbing or heavier, it would have been crushed even there. It's right at the surface. But in this situation, no problem. We have how many toads did you come across when you were working in the greenhouse? About three or four in, uh, in the span of three minutes. So yeah. Just yeah. They're a major part of our biocontrol in that greenhouse. No slug problems. Ground kind of bugs, we don't have problems. The toads take care of them. All right, this is the way the big boys do it. Okay? And that's not a very good picture. We'll see more. But what there is there is a coulter, a disc that's real sharp that cuts the cover crop and separates it, and then a ripper that comes through and rips open a, a thing to plant into. And that's what's happened there. The shadows, unfortunately, hide it pretty well, but maybe now I can try the pointer here. If I can find it. Where is it now? OK, I got it now. All right, good. Right there, that dark area has been ripped open by that culture. And um, thing. I think we're going to get a better shot of it right this second here. No, that's what it looks like, right? But that tool there is probably $2,000 or something. It's not cheap at all, you know? Um, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's only $1,200 or $900. But it's, it's expensive. And for some people, that's a lot of money, you know? Um, and a smaller version is what we're going to you know, similar thing is what's going to be on the tool that John Morrison and Becky Cummings are going to show us. Um, they're going to use something like that. There you see it in action. That is a no-till um, ripper or something. It's, it, it basically is for, you know, making a rip through. And they're just doing it in grass there, but in a laid down cover crop like you saw before, you'd rip that open, come through with a no-till planter, which Ron Morris, who, this, who was demonstrating this, has since invented something that will come through and rip that open and drop compost or other organically allowed fertilizers into that furrow. And then you can come right behind there with a planter, like they pull behind tractors and drop plants. So you could actually do a lot of work in a hurry. Or you could have interns that could be the planters and come through and pop them into those se sections that you ripped open. You know? um, we're not there yet, but we hope to have those tools. We're hoping to get Ron to make us one, but we've just 
have to keep talking to him about when he has time to do that. He's promised us one. We have it approved, but it hasn't been made yet. But we might get there. Um, we just need to remind him more how much we want it. Okay, so I guess that's it. I was hoping that we had a better shot of the hole, but that's the tool that does it. Um, and then we're kind of like jumping back now. We kind of covered some of our tools there. I thought the tree planter really showed up. I wonder if that didn't get in there somehow. Did you see it? No, you didn't see these things when you were doing them, right? We'll see if it shows up. If not, I'll describe it to you. Um, okay, yeah, it's going to be there next. All right, so I guess the tool there is the ladder. That's just showing you how tall those tomatoes get, you know, how productive they are. Um, those are the tomatoes that were planted on cover crop that had been rolled down and didn't die easily. This one here, the title, Tools Villain Converted to a Well-Intentioned Player. Um, Cody, this really incredibly talented young man who I got Hector Diaz from Salsa to hire as his farmer, just really loved to till because it made a nice soil bed and I was trying to teach him not to till. And he really like, he wanted that fine layer on top. He just really wanted it. A lot of people do, you know? I mean, when Diane would work with me, she just wanted to break every clod up. You know? It's just kind of like having to pop a zit. You know, you're just like, no clods, fine, nice, easy, wonderful soil, right? So finally, he heard me enough, and he came up with this innovation, which is he made a skid so that that nasty soil destruction tool, I mean, the mantis tiller, man, that just makes flour. All of your structure gone. Never use one. Unless you're trying, like in paths, and you don't want fertility, you want to kill weeds, then it's fine. But when you want fertility, it is the antithesis of fertility. Um, but he made it so that it floats above, and only the top half inch gets tilled. Go ahead. If you have to have that fine soil, a top inch of destruction, not too bad. The world, yes. Yes. The horse-drawn plow. The problem with it is it's going to be flipping it, right? There's more disturbance. You know, there actually are from the 30s and back. We actually have one. We hope to rebuild. That Ed, Ed Updike, a longtime attendee here, who now is harder of hearing and can't make it out anymore. He just donated a 1930s no-till drill. They were doing it all the way back then, you know? And that was pulled by a tractor, but with a big team of horses, you could pull it. It's ground-driven. You could pull it with that. It's heavy enough, you're not going to pull it with one horse, you know? But that, when you're just doing this kind of ripping, it's much less disturbance. And you're, you know, even then, they knew to leave that cover crop residue in there. When you're plowing, you're flipping it. So you haven't incorporated as much oxygen as you do when you till, but you still have incorporated a lot of oxygen, and you're flipping this readily breakdownable stuff and it's going to go away really fast. Plus, you've done enough disturbance that you know, the soil is a web of life, right? And there's life that is supposed to be here, and life that's supposed to be there, and life that's supposed to be there. And you flip it now, and the life that's supposed to be there is now here. You know? So it's not like it won't recover. And that kind of plowing is way better than other things we do, but not as good as probably this method. Um, or at least that's the way we're now looking at it. Of course, I just said it at the beginning of this. There are other ways. I don't want to say there's only one way, but this is the direction we're looking at. You know? And even Jeff Poppin, who's doing old time farming, isn't plowing. You know? That doesn't mean a first time to get rid of bad grasses and get, get the, bad, the field more level. You wouldn't come through and plow, but then you might try and get away from it after that. Does that make sense? All those tools could be adapted to walk behind tractors, I'm sure, you know? Yeah, they're, they're, they, all those old-timey tools are still very valuable. It's just how much we want to use a plow, probably not that much, you know? Yeah, I mean, like, one of the, kind of one of the things that you're showing right here, uh -huh. like, the one that's downstairs, I mean, Yeah, it's a lot of energy. It'd be nice to have something else do that work. Yes, right, yeah, totally, yeah. Well, we're going to see a, a version that was made to go behind the grillo, you know? And that's going to be in about 20 minutes. Um, OK, so this here is that bed. We were out there. We looked at We saw this already. Um, and this is where we scythe. And what's wrong with this? Oh, give me that little red thing here. I'm not so sure it's worth the time to look for it. Yeah. Where am I? OK, I got it. All right. So what's wrong with this is all this stuff, the crisscrossing, right? John, you wouldn't want to have to try and run your machine through that, would you? Ain't going to happen. <laughs> not not going to work, right. 
Now, we're going to show another one, which I think if it were dry, probably would work, and I'd like to hear if you agree. Okay? Still, that's the siding. Not at all. Way too hard to get through. Um, could you reach through and plant? Yeah, you could do that, you know? But trying to cut through it, it's not going to happen. Okay. Still, just a tangle. And here I think I say, yeah, tangle results of the side, right? Um, that's piled up on itself. Okay, we're going to get to that picture eventually, I guess, but it's not where I thought it was. This is where trying to deal with the vetch and trying to even use the flail mower, we literally have to like peel the vetch in on itself and then get the, vet, the flail mower up on its wheels, on, on the back wheel, on the back of it, and like come at it like a lawnmower when you're trying to knock stuff down. It's really a joke. It's really a mess, you know? So we're just through with vetch. Vetch does not work for no-till, you know? It's just like <laughs> we all agree that we're going to have it come back for a long time because it's gone to seed. Um, and this is where in the... I think this is actually in the greenhouse where we had a big crop of Sudex, which is the sedan sorghum cover crop, and crotalaria, or sun hemp, and cow peas. And they were getting big enough that they were competing with our crops, so we just came through and flailed them. And now that would be a mulch that we could plant, to, plant through for the winter. you know. Um, and that, that's what we flailed down. That's what came down. So those are kind of out of order. You should see this first and then that. So that got just taken down with the flail mower. Once again, a really hard job, but it came down. Not as hard as the vetch, because the vetch is so ropey. It's much harder to deal with, you know? But you can see how that would be competing with tomatoes. So you let it get a certain size and then just take it down. It sits there, covers the soil. Hopefully the next slide is going to be the one. No, just, that is the, the sun hemp. It's showing you just how incredibly vigorous that is. That's the top of it. That's, that's the roots. And, oops, nope, wrong thing here. That is a nodule. They make huge nodules. People know what I mean by nodule? Legumes make houses for rhizobia bacteria so that the rhizobia bacteria can fix nitrogen from the air, right? And the crotalaria has amazing um, nodules. Now, I don't know how much, I forget how much nitrogen it fixes, but I sure am impressed by the nodules. Look at the roots. Those roots are really breaking the soil up, really, you know. And crotalaria, our sun hemp, is so lignous that when you knock it down, it will last way through the winter and just a slow feed, right? This slow fungal feed covering the soil for a long time. You know? um, really impressive. Okay. This is my trick, right? This is my trick for when somebody said, how do you make a seed bed? And, you know, a fine seed bed without doing some kind of way of working it up. You use biology and time. So we came in, we flail mode. Then we, because we can make compost tea, and anybody can look it up, there's tons of recipes, right? We then spray it with compost tea, so we knew we had a lot of good bacterial activity and fungal activity. We then covered it with the fabric so it was nice and warm and moist, right? We put drip down there, too. And then we let it just sit there for about eight weeks. Came back, nothing but fine, nicely composted cover crop. Ready to plant. The whammy, the thing I didn't know about that I now know about, and boy, is it a whammy. Ron Morris had mentioned that Sudex is so allelopathic that he actually has had it inhibit the growth of seedlings. Now, I've, allelopathic is plants like walnuts that put out chemicals so they can compete and inhibit germination and make plants not do well. I'd never had that problem. We put big enough plants in and we put enough like compost starter mix in each hole, hole that that effect was diluted. But here, we direct seed it carrots, beets, and turnips. The only stand we had that was decent was the turnips, which we normally seed so heavily that it looks like it's a cover crop. And what we had was like three nice thin lines. Carrots, hardly any. Beets eventually straggled along, and we had a kind of scattered, lousy bed. None of them came up anywhere near the time they should. They all were about, oh, five weeks behind. And I remember saying someplace into like the second week that, that, that we'd open these beds up, by now there should be lots of weeds, take a flamer over it, and stale bed, where you actually come through and flame off the weeds so that they're not there when you seed. It's a great way to control weeds. That's why I have a flamer down there. You don't have to do any cultivation. You just take the weeds out first. I should have registered it, but I didn't. My coworker said, Pat, there's no weeds. I was like, oh, great. Why were there no weeds? Because nothing would grow there because of that allelopathic <laughs> effect. But if you don't have that, if, so the way to solve that is to give it more time, and then maybe once you take the cover off, come back and hit it again with compost tea. You know, biology will get rid of that but you just have to plan for it, you know? Knock it down a little earlier, wait longer, eventually that effect will go away. But it can be a powerful effect. I had no idea how powerful. 
Will you continue to use Sudex? Oh yeah, sure. It's, it makes so much biomass. It competes so well. Yeah. I mean, and usually we're not trying to grow, mostly we do plants. We don't do much direct seeding at all. But in a greenhouse, we can direct seed those kind of crops and they do well. You know, outdoors, the only thing we seed is carrots. We don't even seed beets anymore. They do better as plants for us. Okay. Um, this is just my grousing about vetch. Just what a pain. It's going to drive us nuts. It does drive us nuts, you know. Um, this end needs a flail mower. The other end, there's rye that we can easily knock down that you can run a machine through. Nothing's getting through that. I actually, we didn't take the time. You can look at it at, after, the, after we're done if you want to go look at it. You go to that same end we were on and look at the bottom. I purposely ran the roller over pure vetch. I guarantee you, it'll look like there used to be a path there, but it's going to be about that high by now. I guarantee you it just came right back. You know? That roller had no impact on it at all. Um, and it's right, I went right there where that dock is. I went right through there. And I'd be very surprised if it wasn't already two thirds recovered. Okay. And that's just more, I don't know why I have these vetch things, because it's driving me nuts. You know? <laughs> I want to, okay, this is Ron Morris and Mark Schoenbeck. They literally plant their cover crops with an earthway cedar. That precise. And that really, I mean, John, you could see how there, that wouldn't be hard to get at all. You just find one of those strips that there isn't any cover crop and go right down through there, and you would probably rip through it really easily. So you might consider that, you know. Um, and also what Ron does is he, in the planting area, grows a legume, which usually breaks down faster, not vetch, other legumes, right, like crimson clover. And then on the side, he grows what looks like barley there. Now, why you want to grow a legume and a, and, a, and a grain is that the legume makes nitrogen. The grain demands nitrogen, therefore the legume has to make more nitrogen. So it's a wonderful synergy. You always want that combination. But he doesn't want to deal with the grain where he's running his no-till equipment. So he grows in the, the growing zone, right? I call the plant zone, really, it's just a growing zone. He grows the legume, and then on the edges, he grows the grain. And so that's something to consider, too. That might work really well for you. You could do something like peas if you weren't using machines. They'd be pretty easy to manage, you know? Um, it'd probably be a problem if you're trying to use a no-till cedar, but there'd be one of, the, one of these legumes would work. That's me seeding into the bed that I thought would winter kill. It was a spectacular co summer cover crop, really high and healthy. And then right below my bucket and next to me is one of those crops of buckwheat and cow peas. It's now late enough in the season that the cow peas are starting to get riddled. The buckwheat's done. But that's where all that um, nut sedge was and stuff. And it's all pretty well suppressed. And the way we planted that was to spread the seed out, come over and mow it down. And it established that thickly. So you can see how well that works. Then you can see the cover crop are knocking down. And then, remember I talked about how fast that grew? That is probably about four days after I seeded it. But it was right when that moon was perfect. And it just popped like crazy. I mean, I can't believe how tall it was. You can see it's not even fully green. And indeed, even the oil seed radish is starting to pop. Just incredible. Incredible if you hit the timing right. And this cover crop, it did spectacularly. That might be why it didn't die so well, actually, when I think about it. I just, it, it had so much nitrogen from the previous cover crop that it just is amazing how well it did. And there's an example. That's how lush it was. You know? What you see in there is just the um, oilseed radish. And actually, there's a little bit of fenugreek. I'll come back here. Well, I look for my, if you see that little dot, tell me where it is. OK, I got it. OK. Right there, that's actually fenugreek. You can see it's kind of a legume. And why I grew fenugreek is it also winter kills. It's just too expensive and too hard to find. But it's really, it'd be a great one if we could get it. Because it, in, in, in tropical countries, I'm sure it's readily available. It's grown as a green in India and, of course, an important spice in curry. It's also medicinal. But it's very wimpy, so it'd be very easy to kill. But it is a legume. What I'm going to try next year is going to be um, Burr seam clover, because it's supposed to winter kill too, and you can get a lot of growth on it. So we'll see. Have you ever worked with burr seam clover? Yeah, that's, that sounds like a winner. So that's what I'm going to try next year. I just have learned enough this year to know that it's next on my list. We're still working on what the mix is. There's another shot, not quite so spectacular, not quite as good a take. Some of those weeds down in that spot right there are going to be some of the weeds that you see later on, you know? that were there now when we looked at it and why stuff didn't kill so well. But this is the bed that now doesn't look very well killed, but was supposed to die perfectly. And then this here 
is spring barley almost exclusively. And this year, here in this place, not mixed together with other things, it totally killed in December. I wish I had a picture, but it was dead as a doornail. I was hoping for more growth longer in the season, totally dead. Which has been the case, usually, for spring barley, but never have I grown it as well as I did this year. So maybe you don't grow it so well if you want to kill it, you know? Um, that's that, that whole bed. You can see how well that cover crop took. It just totally dominates. At that stage, had I been able to chop it down then and plant into it, I would have had no weed problems. Those weeds only came back because the cover crop died back and then the weeds got a chance. Right there, I have a, a good smothering. Okay. This here is John Rowland. I love our community, right? John Rowland couldn't make this workshop, but he has our farm up in Weaverville. As I said to him, he, was, he thought he had to remind me who he was. I said, there's no way I don't know you, John. You're in my pantheon of founding farmers for the North, for Western North Carolina's organic farming movement. He's been farming for a long time, sells only wholesale, grows tons of food, and he's experimenting. That's why I want to have a symposium next time with no-till. He planted oilseed radish and crimson clover. What happened for him was the oilseed radish shaded out the crimson clover. The crimson clover didn't do it all well. Eventually, the oilseed radish froze out. This spring, I think he said in March, he came out and just broadcast spinach seed everywhere. It was so dry that it didn't do much of anything. He thought it was a total loss. He even plowed up the middle of it and put potatoes in. I only got one picture into this, but there's a longer picture. Once it started raining, you can see the size of those spinach plants? Just by scattering seeds, $750 crop he's harvesting now. He doesn't want to harvest it. It's so gorgeous, I can't stand to harvest it. You know? <laughs> um, and that's, that's the cool thing about farmers. They fall in love with their crops. You know, when they have that kind of success, you know, um, so he accomplished what I was trying to accomplish. You know, it can be done. You just got to have to get the right mix. This is the facilia before it was knocked down. If you saw when we were out there, the rye is dead. That facilia is coming right back up. It didn't crimp out. It's not going to die that easy. Still learning, you know. Most farmers, I'm going to be speaking at the cover crop conference, the SARE cover crop conference this summer. Most farmers don't even think you can grow it here. They haven't been able to figure out when to grow it. I know how to grow it, now I've got to figure out how to kill it. But one thing at a time. Okay. Just more of the facilia, and that's actually, that shows you where there's going to be problems, the facilia and that dock. Neither of those are going to roll down. This is the bed that we rolled down. That, that's what it looked like when we first rolled it down. The facilia and the mint now are all coming back. So it rolled down well, but the weeds have come back. You know? um, uh, it, I've forgotten, is facilia, does it winter kill? It often does. For most people, it does. But in that mix, it didn't. You know. So is it a perennial? No, it's not in our climate. Not in our climate. It's not okay. a perennial. I don't know it's a perennial anywhere. For us, it's definitely an annual. Okay. You know, or a biennial. It's a biennial because if you can get it to overwinter, it's going to go to seed the next spring. But oftentimes it kills, which is fine. You can put. It, really, I recommend getting it in sometime in anywhere from mid-August till late September, early October, and you should get good growth depending on the year. Now, two years ago, we were bitter cold in early November. It probably got wiped out in that year. It wouldn't have made it. But usually our years are right that we can do it that way. And there's the bed. That one, John, I think you probably could run your machine through that, do you think? Yeah. That, if it were dry enough, I'd like you to try it. I wish you could try it because you know, it would inform me about trying to convince the nonprofit to buy, buy your machine. You know. Um, so if you look close at that and give me an opinion, that'll inform me too. You know, um, I understand it's not a promise. We'll learn. You know, but that there is how you want it, and that's what we saw out there. It was so nicely rolled down. It's nice and straight. You can go through it real easy. You know, there's a few peas left in there, but there weren't that many peas anyways. Probably pretty workable. Okay. This is an example of the biomass. That we had an earlier picture of that. That's the sun hemp, or crotalaria, now dead. And that there, definitely easily killed with the cold. Sudex is not easily killed. Sudex, you can cut it back to the ground, it'll re-sprout. It'll grow six feet twice in a year. But first frost and it's dead. So it's a good strategy for crops that you plant after frost. It's a great strategy. You can let it grow, then come through and knock it down. Or knock it down right before the frost. And even plant before the frost, because you know the frost is going to kill it before it competes with, let's say, your garlic. you know, or later turnips or um, later greens, all those things you could just count on this for your mulch. You know, just knock it down, plant through it, and be good. Either knock it down with a mower, 
Something I haven't mentioned that a lot of people do, and it often works well, you just have to play with it. If you back a tiller up over a lot of these crops, it'll often crimp it and knock it down well enough. You know? Just make sure you know what you're doing if you're backing your tiller up. You know? <laughs> Sometimes just if you can get your tiller to go with the, without the, the tiller part engaged, that will knock it down and kill it too. So there's different ways that you can play with before you get a tool. You know? And my goal, I would just love to see this happen, is to have these kind of rollers available to share. You know, for there to be tool libraries, because who needs them more than a, the problem is we all want them at the same time, so we have to cooperate really well. But if we can cooperate really well, that can really work. You know, um, we just have to learn to do that. That's a major goal for our culture, I think. Okay, so this is now I'm getting towards the end. Another thing you can do, right, with cover crops we talked about it a little bit is smother crop. Okay, and this is a great example. You can see a whole lot of what I call bindweed, perennial morning glory, really a nasty weed. Because like comfrey, like mugwort, comfrey is actually kind of benign compared to some of these other ones, right? Every little piece that you don't get out of the ground re-sprouts. A piece that big will make a new plant, okay? So, and it's a perennial root, it comes back every year, it seeds like crazy. The way to get rid of it is smothering. If you notice there, Come on, I had you there a minute. Okay, yeah. If you notice, well, I don't know if you can see that anymore. But anyways, you can see in the foreground that there's bindweed. But where the cover crop is really booming, there's no color. And I can I can testify. I looked in there, and maybe where out here I could count, you know, anywhere from 25 to 50 in a given 10 foot square area. In there, I couldn't find one every 25 square feet. You know, um, just it was outcompeted, and so then it's smothered. Yes. Do you have experience with quack grass? Yeah, you can you can smother that out. You can smother it out if you get your if you do your fast growing cover crops enough. You might have to do tillage to knock it back enough to be able to get the thing in. You know, I don't really how I got rid of Johnson grass, which is probably much worse. I did something which is the anathema to um, no till. I did bare fallow. It was a dry year. I came through not with a tiller but with a cultivator. And every time I saw green, I swept up tons of roots. I let them dry out. Then when they started to go green again, I swept. I had six weeks of drought. By the end of the six weeks, 97% of a heavily infected Johnson grass farm was cleaned up. You know? And I think that's OK. One time, if you don't want to use herbicides, and there are plenty of people that argue that that's where you shoot herbicides, the damage to the soil. It just depends on how non-toxic those herbicides suppose. We know now that Roundup is implicated with some 70% of the amphibian loss. Those amphibians are reproducing in the vernal pools, those big puddles in those fields, and that stuff's going right through their skins and taking them out. You know, and that's, science, that's, that's documented by an environmental ecologist in, at the University of Pittsburgh. You can find it. Of course, Monsanto's got a lot of arguments against it, but he defends that pretty well. You know? um, and I don't tend to trust Monsanto very much. Okay, um, Here, basically what we've done is we've allowed the buckwheat to start moving in on our um, finishing squash. We don't care that it's now being outcompeted because we want that to happen. That squash is about done, and what we've done is to say, okay, at this point, let the buckwheat come in, sown under it, just take over. And you can do that lots. You can decide, okay, I've undersown this, I know that it won't compete until I don't care, and then I've got a cover crop there. I can either come in and remove that squash or wait for it to die, it doesn't matter because it's no longer the main thing growing there, it's the buckwheat. Okay? And here's another example. This was buckwheat sown in with beets, because beets are slow growers, and the buckwheat actually is suppressing the chickweed, which is a much bigger problem. The buckwheat's going to freeze out any day now and be gone. You know, it hasn't really competed with the beets very much, so it looks like it's competing. They've kind of grown well. It's going to freeze out, and by that time, the beet is way ahead of the chickweed, and it's going to grow and suppress that chickweed way better way more effectively, pardon my English. Anyway, that might be. OK, and this is the last one. And this is, really, I just had to put this in because I love this shot. <laughs> it's got a little bit to, know with, to do with no-till and that we're using buckwheat. Um, and it looks like we might have um, crotillaria in there and cow peas. And so we're growing a smothering cover crop. You've seen plenty of them already. But what it's all about is right there. Notice that there's no eye there. Why? Because that butterfly has been notched. A bird wanted to take it out, and it went for its eye, except for its eye was a, was a, 
expendable piece of its wing. And that's the genius of nature, and that's the whole point of this. I mean, nature is brilliant, and we are far wiser to work with it, right? Find the ways that we get plants to work for us than trying to figure out how to kill them with herbicides or destroy them with cultivation. You know, and that just, to me, is a wonderful testimony to the genius of um, nature. And that's the end of the slideshow, and I think we can go to John's. If we have time, I still have several other no-till applications we can talk about. We'll see if we have time, okay? Yes, come on in and, and take over, okay? Well, I mean. Quick question about ripping. Yes, okay. Inside the greenhouse where you're not going to get the big machines and you have them. How deep does that furrow need to be? It doesn't need to be that deep at all, especially if you're putting some compost. Remember what I said about Jeff Poppin saying the compost right. helps to open it up? Just so deep enough for you. Is a drag mistake of a tiller? The not running, yeah, it probably could be. Yeah, if you can get that to do it, yeah, you just need big enough to be able to put your plant in. That's all. Okay. Yeah, um, the roots can. I mean, we have to think babies. The roots have to be babied. Lots of people hurt their plants because they're afraid to properly set them, and they want that setting. You know, they want that setting so they can get capillary action when they're in shock. Roots are really powerful. I mean, what roots can grow through is incredible. You know, so you don't have to worry about your roots. Just make it that they get a start, and they're okay. Go ahead and take over. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> I'm John Morrison. I'm an agricultural engineer. And uh, today, I probably wear two hats. Uh, I'm associated with ag engineering uh, and uh, soil science people at uh, Knoxville at the university. But today, uh, I have a contingency with me from the World Health Foundation. The official name is World Health Through Technology Foundation. and uh, Mr. Harvey Selner is back here at the back. He's the director of it. He's out of Durham. And uh, this Becky Cummins here, retired engineer. Uh, so Harvey's an engineer. I'm an engineer. Becky's an engineer. Everybody's an engineer. Uh, so, but I'm an agricultural engineer. And we've worked on these conservation things for so long. Well, we started out, it was no-till. And then it was conservation tillage. And now it's conservation agriculture. You know how terminology morphs. As, as, as it goes along. Uh, but our main emphasis really was after being in some of the developing countries and principally in Africa was the smallholder farmers that have no more than five acres. A lot of them have maybe one, two acres of land or something like that. And their subsistence often, often, those, often that land. Well, there are quite a few uh, NGO types of organizations, United Nations, World Bank, International Fund for Ag Development, and so forth and so on, that are uh, sponsoring agricultural development in these countries for the smallholders. And basically, what is uh, happening there is that they're promoting conservation agriculture. They decided that that, and if you will, if you want to translate and call that no-till, I don't know how your terminology and how you, uh, uh, but they feel that that is the best known technology, set of practices, basically, to try to get away from this feast or famine situation that so many village people have over in those countries. Okay, so why are we talking about Africa and we're here in Western Carolina? Uh, basically, we're talking about the same kind of technology if we're talking about market gardening. You know, as we're talking about smallholders, wherever, global smallholders. And, and it, the thing is, it's the scale of the equipment and the scale of the operations. So it doesn't matter if we're in Pakistan or if we're here. If you're in a relatively small scale intensity type of conservation agriculture slash no-till, and you need tools, you, you're going to need roughly the same kinds of tools to do it. And our analogy that we like to use is if you're going to build a house, it's great to have a really good hammer. Well, if you're going to do this kind of agriculture, smallholder agriculture, it's great to have appropriate size implements that really work for you. And so, so that's kind of where we are. We're just trying to, as retired engineers, we're trying to make a contribution. And it just so happens that what we've been working on for overseas it just is perfect for market gardening in the states. So, so that's so that's that's where we are. Um, 
Okay, so what we wanted to show you this afternoon, we brought along a small one row seeder for row crop seeding. Uh, most of uh, the work's been done with uh, corn and with beans, that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, it's powered with a two wheel tractor, a uh, reel. How many people have BCF reel tractors? How many people are we talking to? Okay. Is everybody else with four wheel tractors, bigger stuff? Yes, 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 yes. And no tractors. Okay, how about no tractors? <laughs> oh, mercy. Okay. I think we should have brought the, the animal tow. We, we actually have been hauling this, this cedar we're going to show you with a pair of mules. And, uh, and well, we've got a single hitch for one mule and a, and a, and a team hitch for, for the court. So, so this same kind of a technology we know is uh, applicable to go with different kinds of power sources. The reason that we're using the two-wheel tractors, we call them, uh, what do you call them? Walk-behind Walk behind tractors, okay. Uh, is the one we've got here is a 10 horsepower drill. Uh, is that uh, a lot of these countries, these developing countries are now importing them by the thousands, maybe tens of thousands a year. Uh, they, you know, they were, you see pictures from Bangladesh and over in, in Asia, and, and they're all using these little walk-behind tractors out of their paddies, their rice paddies, with these got these steel wheels on them and so forth. But uh, the ones with the regular tractor tires are being used, and they're uh, all across Asia, and now they're importing them into Africa. They're importing them into uh, Mexico. We have one machine down in Mexico under evaluation, and so this has become apparent to a lot of people that if you're going to move away from animal draft, this is the next step in mechanization. You know, this is the smallest scale mechanization that's available after you go from animal draft. So that, that's, you know, that's, that's just kind of where we are. And there's so much interest in it overseas and everywhere in, in this level of mechanization that that's, that that's what we've chosen to do. Okay, uh, I'm talking too much, but I was trying to give you an idea of, of, of what's happening. So before we go out there, because it will be harder to, to talk out there. So we have this little cedar, and what, what happened to Pat? He went up to turn the oven off. Ah, <laughs> okay. I don't know if we're, he said we're going to run in the greenhouse where he's run a flail through some cover crop. Uh, and I don't know if we're putting down seed or if we're just seeing the machine go through the field and assume that it puts down seed. Uh, when we get down there to the cedar, there's a couple, three things I'd like to show you about it, but it's gonna be harder to you know, see and talk when we're, than, we, than when, when we are right here. Any immediate questions before we go down, downstairs? The cedars, uh, there are some being made by Federelli in Brazil, okay? And that is actually the, that's being commercially uh, available. Our cedar is now being manufactured by Stone Mountain Technologies up in Johnson City. And we're actually looking for another manufacturer which will uh, carry it on in a larger scale so we can you know, get a, a larger scale production. So we're in the first, first run, first production run basically up there. What we've essentially done, we've given the design, we, we've developed it, we've tested it, we've given the design to Stone Mountain for them to manufacture it in the most expedient way that they can do it. And that's the cedar that you see today. Uh, so we're, we're just getting into this. And this is what's happening. Uh, Pat was talking about the, the rototiller, don't use it. Okay, what's happening is that they're importing from China, mostly, all of these walking tractors with the rototillers. Mm -hmm. And they're selling this to these poor African farmers to go out and ruin their land. Amen. So uh, we are trying to <laughs> provide an alternative technology that we think in the long run, we, I, we know in the long run, is going to be better for them.
and and there's not much available. So we're just kind of waiting for the market to develop overseas, and we're uh, anticipating that the market gardening uh, sector here in the country and whatnot will probably pick them up on it and provide the uh, market for, for the manufacturers so that we can keep them available until the international market opens up. I could talk all day, but I don't know. Please. Well, they're, uh, the ones from overseas, the ones from, they're made in India and China and so forth, are almost all these diesel engines. These big old clunky, low, slow speed diesel engines, and their exhaust is so bad that you can't import them into the States. They won't allow it. And so, for instance, we have the Grillo tractor out here, they're from Italy and whatnot, and of course they have the gasoline engine on them, but you can buy most of these. I'm not sure, sure, does uh, BCS or Grillo, can you buy a diesel? Yes, you can. Okay. So, so you can buy an option here, a diesel or a gasoline option for, for, for them. And, uh, and we've run these cedars with eight horsepower, little old 40, 50 years old Gravely tractor, uh, eight horsepower, and it's fine. So it's, power is not a, a big issue when you're using a one row cedar. And one row cedars, we determined that they are large enough for many, many situations, and the weight of them, it gets the weight down to the point where a person can use them conveniently. So many places say, well, if one roll works, why not two? Well, it's a double the expense, and then they get pretty heavy and bulky and really difficult to, to handle, and don't think we really need it you know, to, to, get, to get the job done out there. Harvey, did you bring some handouts? No, I didn't. Oh, okay. I thought you had handouts for us today. Okay. So, okay. We don't have handouts. So, I'm sorry. Uh, we don't have contact information. Hand okay. So, we're not here. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Uh, anything? Uh, well, I've got, I, I do have cards. I do have business cards with an email. Pardon now? Do uh, The website is and I'm embarrassed by this. This is due to Stone Mountain and not to me. My name is Morrison. They, they named the website morrisoncedars.com. How do you spell Morrison? With two R's. I think they know. There's lots of Morrison scattered around the Carolinas, I think. Uh, can I just, uh, I'll just pass this little pack of cards around if people want to take some. There's some with my consulting, uh, the cards and some of them are, are uh, University of Tennessee cards. Okay, are you ready to go downstairs? You know what we might ought to do uh, with Pat returning is maybe take a brief break. If okay. If you can use the restroom and stuff or get water, that might be a good idea, okay? And where are the restrooms? There's two restrooms back here. There's water in this sink. It's a good, good source of water. Okay, and so we'll, we'll meet you all downstairs uh, by, yeah, by the machines. I'm okay, down there. Okay. okay, thank you for your interest. So at 4.30, we'll be there. I know, look at I spoke to a BCS dealer down here in Charlotte, North Carolina. Yes. And he claims he's just recently sold the last diesel BCS tractor in the United States, and they can't. They can't import anymore? Yeah. It's They've got, oh. Because of the because of the polar engine, I guess, is it isn't up to snuff with EPA rules? Yeah, okay. Yeah, see, see, that's what happens with all the Asian ones. They won't pass the inspection, yeah, so they can't, they can't import them. I was surprised to hear that. I don't, know, I don't know if it's totally true what he had, he had oh. told me that. Oh, well, it may be. I, I don't know. I mean, we have gasoline engine, and that's what we were interested in. We weren't in, interested in the diesel for here, for what we, you know, right. for what we, this is our demonstration unit. As far as, I was, I was surprised we just had the grill over, because a lot of people don't like that the, there's not as many uh, vendors or dealers for the parts. Oh. I was, in it. I was kind of looking at it. Well, we were going for the price. That's, that's, what, that's what I was thinking. Now, this is an 85D. 85D. You know, it has a differential lock in it. The D is for a differential lock. So the answer lock. is yes, I want to plant some beans. So I'm going to get bean seed, okay? Oh, yeah. Yeah, get me okay. some beans. That'll be right. fine. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah. Pat, you want them about two inches apart? Yeah, sounds good.
Okay. Okay. Do you get it? Do you get it from uh, Earthway Tools? Earth Tools. So yeah, yeah, up up in uh, uh, Kentucky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, they they they've been really good to us up yeah. there and all that. And so uh, yeah. So and, yeah, let's say it's it's just our demonstration unit and whatnot. Right. But but you'll see. Well, I'll show you. We've had we've added some ballast weights to it and some stuff like that. Yeah. And you're using what? I was on the market for a diesel one because we have a lot of clay. We're up, mm. in, the, up in the mountains near Morganton. And, uh, yeah. Like yeah, yeah, but, but, but if you do this stuff, you don't really, the clay shouldn't bother you. You know, I mean, because you're, you're not, it's not like you're doing major tillage, you know, with the thing. The, I want to do the rotary plow and get it up, get it up to raised bed status and then kind of do this. Ah. Yeah, see, that's, that's the trouble with the raised bed. I, I did a big long project in raised beds kind of thing. And the problem is with raised beds, I mean, there's a lot of advantages, but the problem is it takes so much energy, you know, to, to make the beds that you almost need, if you can have, if you can actually hire, if you can rent a machine or something or power to, to make those beds, because it's not economical to own the machinery the, the tractor and the machinery to make the beds because it takes so much energy and for the rest of the time you don't need that. Yeah. You see what I mean? Right. And so if you can, that's a better way out. Yeah. Well, they're, they're, if you want to use a power harrow and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. And of course we're using, we're in no tilt, you know, kind of thing. And so, so we're not doing, so we're, you know, we're only in the ground an inch and a half. Right. You know, and so you don't need the traction, you don't need that much power, you know. And, and when you do that, it changes the whole, you know, your whole method of operation, oh, yeah. you know. Yeah, you just let the roots do the bio plowing, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you just don't, uh, you don't apply, you know, tillage energy down to, to the bulk of the soil, okay. even if it is clay. I don't know, you know, you're in the red Piedmont clay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. right. Right. You know, and some people say, well, that's the worst soil for no-till. And, you know, and we've found out that it's the best soil for no-till because, you know, it holds a lot of moisture. Yeah, it does. As long as you don't have to, to, to bulk till it, you know, plow it, manhandle it, you know, and so you don't, you know. And, and the, more, <coughs> the more residue that you have on the surface, you know, your organic matter comes up. Yeah. You, know, you increase your organic matter and then it becomes more friable and then less clay, you know? And, and so over a period of time, I mean, after three years, you can just see quite a lot of difference. In the, and, and pretty soon that heavy clay soil, you know, is crumbly on that top surface. And that's all you're concerned about because you just want, you know, and then with the, with the residue, the water will soak down through that, you know, and it'll percolate and percolate down through those old root paddle so that, channels and that, all that. That thing you did, you said you, you didn't like the raised beds? Well, the thing was, I liked them for drainage, for high intensity rainstorms, because where I was, you'd get some high intensity rainstorms and the furrows would be, or the, if your furrows would, would be running full of water, you know. But uh, uh, building them was too much energy. It wasn't compatible with the rest of the stuff that we were doing. That was the trouble. We're talking about the raised beds, you know, and, and, the, and the problem is in the heavy clay soil, it takes so much energy to build the raised beds. In the rest of your system, you don't need that much energy. Right, well, and indeed, as I was saying out in the field, I can't get our grill up into the bed with the roller. If it's at all moist and stuff, the weight of the roller and stuff, it, I have to like just about get a hernia to push that thing up in there. Hmm. You know? yeah. It's just that much, you know, it's just harder to work. On the other hand, we're in a bowl here, and it's, this used to be a lake. Hmm. We have wet weather springs everywhere. We have to have raised beds. Oh, uh, yeah. It's way See. too wet, you know? So it just depends, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and you situation. might decide that you want to get in early in the springtime, you need those beds to warm up. Sure. But there's plenty of places we don't. I wouldn't automatically do raised beds. You know, you yeah. just, every situation takes like, you know, some experimenting, paying attention, yeah. do some raised beds, yeah. do some flat yeah. beds, see what works, see but, what the many problems are, you know. But does anybody here use strip tillage? The people, some people do strip tillage, yeah. Because see, for a person with for heavy clay soils, mm -hmm. the strip tillage is, is great. Because mm -hmm. have, have you played with it or seen it? I've seen it, yeah. Yeah, because you, you go through and you run, pre-run those rows, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm couple weeks or whenever uh, ahead of time when you're uh, and then you come back and you plant or plant into them later and that the soil now has is just enough time that it's mellowed and you can run back through and you get an excellent stand of crop where, where you have 
uh, crop problems by just you know, direct seeding, you know, one, one pass through seeding, mm -hmm. especially into clay soils. And that's, that's plagued no-till since day one, since 1966, mm -hmm. when we started no-till, mm -hmm. I guess, 66? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, well, there, we have a no-till drill from the 30s, so people have been doing it, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I started on it in 61, so I don't know. Yeah. 62? 62, I built uh -huh. my first no-till uh -huh. planter, I guess. Yeah. But anyway, it's been a while, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> it's been a while. So, so uh, but anyway. So if you're not disturbing, so if you've, you've got a grassy acreage, and it, you know there's clay, right, this far under uh -huh. the ground, you're saying, don't build a bed at all. Just go into the. You have to get rid of that grass. If it's a perennial grass, you're not going to yeah. grow a crop without getting rid of that grass. No, you, you know, you, yeah, you got to get yeah. rid of the grass. You, yeah. It's got to be clean, basically. You know, it's you. Yeah, you but can't. You might need to till once, like I said. You know, I mean, you, yeah. you can't say no tillage. Just as little tillage as possible. You know. Get, yeah. Getting the system started. That's 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 uh -huh. strictly management. Uh -huh. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I, mean, I did a lot of work in the, to bear foul that um, Johnson grass, but it doesn't go away by asking it to, you know. I mean, it's an invasive, ten, you know, tough grass. Shoveling you know? it, shoveling off the top layer and broad forking is what we've been doing, but then also Ooh. tending yeah. on top of that. Yeah. Are you getting rid of it by doing that? Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, yeah. if you can do the work, it's, a, it's, a, it's probably I mean, a pretty easy way to soil. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. yeah. What I, the thing that I would add to all those is I would use easy to kill cover crops underneath the plants. You know that whole conservation tillage thing. They, they were the guy giving all those lectures. I guess it was India or wherever. Um, if they came back with things like fenugreek, which are easy to kill, and had them growing under, then they have the sun pumping food into the soil all the time and suppressing weeds. They have cover when the crop comes off. You know, that's the piece that I think conservation tillage needs to look at next. Is how to always have stuff growing. You know, under soil. Mm -hmm. Never let the soil be bare. Take advantage of the fact that. You know, plants are pumping food into the soil. The sun is a huge source of mm -hmm. energy. You know, it's just the next step. I think we all have next steps. And for me, what I was saying yeah. there is like they haven't gotten to that one. You know. Okay, here you probably can do the never let the soil be bare. In more droughty areas, you can't do that because you don't have enough water. So then you have all you got is the residue. You know, and so yeah. So it depends on where you are. You See, know, you and some of this stuff. While that crop is still growing, those plants get their roots down. Yeah. You, know? you take advantage of the same water that the crop is growing on. Yeah. You know, and they're established, and then they got a chance to go. You know, yeah. there's yeah. a couple of places now. There's a, and I have to, there's a book called *Tropic Chaos* by Michael Parenti, who's talking oh, about the impact of global warming on the tropical areas, which mm. is where it's hitting hardest. Mm. And he talks about a place in Brazil and a place in Africa where they're doing the combination of all these different methods, including the undersowing, never let the soil be bare, and where they've actually raised the water table considerably mm. using these systems. I mean. I, Astoundingly, actually. Now, I haven't well, taken the time to yeah, go back and check Yeah, okay. Notes. Well, the soil water profile will be different. Will, will definitely be different. And that, and that changes your practices. Yeah, you have to realize that. Mm -hmm. It does. Yeah. Yeah, the water mm -hmm. profile is different. But yeah, check out the footnotes for that because I think they're doing some cutting edge stuff for those kinds of places that are really getting the brunt of the changes and getting more drought and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. it's tough. Are we supposed to be, what are yes. we doing? Any more oh. cards? I passed that, I gave that card, I don't know what happened to the if, package. If you run out of cards, we'll put your contact information on our, on our resource page. I gave somebody my pack of cards and I don't know what happened to it. So I guess it got passed through. I guess, what are we doing this here? This is inoculant for the beans. Okay. Um, and will that work? It better be slightly moistened. Okay, can you, have you got somebody that can handle that for yeah, you? Yeah, sure, I can handle that. Yeah. Okay, or yeah. for you? Yeah. Okay, what, do you, what kind of beans are we doing? Beans, we want to try. Cannellini and Taylor Horticultural. Okay. You have a seeder that'll work for that size? Yeah. In that size? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Good. yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let me get them inoculated. And you get into the okay. greenhouse. I'll show okay. You how how do much it. are we doing? How many? Um, I'd like to do like maybe six passes. Is that possible? Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. good. So that's passes. good. We get. To, are we going to do more than one pass on each bed? Yeah. Is that what? Yeah. I'm okay. So we're going to have to ride. Yeah. What, how many can. how many passes? Three on a bed? Yeah. If you okay. can't do what you can, can show drive. us what you can do. You know, I'll, I'll give you my dream and you tell me what's real. Okay. okay. And we'll and we'll try something we're, that we're not used to doing. Yeah. But okay. but you're, you're teaching us. You're teaching right. us. So cool. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's try it. I've still got this mic on. Am I supposed to carry this with me? You're gonna be on most of the right? I'm not gonna lie. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> okay. Gotta go. Excuse me, I'm going to try to sneak through here. Sorry. Where 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So what would you, um, not that this is in production, but... Well, it is in production. Is it? Yeah. yeah. So what, what, what is it not in production? Uh, I think the website has it priced at $1,260. Uh, FOB uh, in Johnson City. Yeah. And the name of the company again was. It's, uh, well, Stone Mountain is the one that's making it. Okay. And they're building it okay. essentially for world health. Okay. It, it's basically what, what the situation is. But it's on your website? And it's on. Yeah. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, my. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, well, I was going to start here, but then they said come over there. What, what was the? Yeah, that's they're doing it over there, I guess. Okay. Okay. Well, this is in the transport mode right at the moment, and then I'll. I'll, so I'll, I'll write it over there. This is how you go from the shed out to the field, okay? And then we'll we'll go from there. Is that good? So folks, while he's getting here, you probably all know it, but I want to remind you, if you're growing legumes, buy the right inoculant and inoculate your legumes so that you get that nitrogen from the air, right? And plants, legumes have little houses, and when it's over there, they bring the nitrogen to the plant. So, does that look like enough for three passes, or do you want more? How many horsepower is this? Yeah. Okay. So here's the first scene whenever you're ready. Oh, okay, thank you. So this is a 10 horsepower grillo. And uh, what, what we've done is you'll see that we have uh, 100 pounds of weight hanging on the front. Uh, the reason for that is that we have the weight of the uh, tractor or the cedar on the back. And, uh, and so for ease of maneuvering and lifting, you have to counterbalance it. When we get over in Asia, these big diesel engines are so heavy, we actually put 100 pounds back here. So it's, it's all different. It just attaches. We have uh, a hitch here for the uh, griller or the BCS that goes onto the tractor to give it a stronger hitch than what the company hitches on it. And it's a one pin attachment here of the cedar onto the tractor. So we normally, in the field operation, we normally run about in the second gear. I'm not so sure what we're gonna do here. And we normally calibrate, and we're not really set up so very good to calibrate here as such. What we have is a, I've got more stuff in the truck I don't have. John, a little bit of reassurance. This already has a cover crop in. We're going to try growing the beans in the cover crop. If it doesn't work, don't worry about it. Yeah, okay. Yeah? Just okay. give it your best shot. We'll see what it can do. Yeah, okay. We'll go. I'm going to get my hands into this, uh, these beans, too, in a slide. While John's doing that, I might point out that uh, to give the tractor extra traction, we've added uh, barbell weights uh, in the tires here. And uh, so there's about 100 pounds of barbell weights and the, uh, the tires themselves have foam, uh, they, they are foamed, I should say, which adds about 40 pounds to each tire. So we're, we've got quite a bit of extra weight on this uh, just for, for traction purposes. Okay. And what do you, what, what's your experience as far as compaction? Do you get much compaction? Uh, compaction in the row? Or yeah, in the row, yeah. No, well, okay, what we have, you all can't see. Uh, the, uh, the, the cedar, I should com explain more here. Okay, let, let me talk about the machine a little bit, okay? 
basically what we've got is a uh, Yetter residue rake wheel on the front to, to clear the bulk of the residue stalks and so forth out of the way, a colder to cut what's left, and then a shank type of opener here to uh, open the soil. Now with the shank type opener, you don't get the compaction and compression that you do with like this, with double disc openers. Uh, you, you know it takes a lot of force to push a disc opener into the ground, and so guess what you're doing? You're compacting the soil all around that, that seeding area, that immediately uh, seed trench area. Uh, some of the, the general uh, specification for no-till drills, for instance, is that you have 400 pounds of weight available for each opener. That's to press the, those disc openers into the soil. And that it's, in the long run, that's probably counterproductive. So this has been selected as a way of uh, operating in more soils under more conditions than you'll get with a, a disc opener. Disc openers will go through and not block. But if you actually look at what they're doing, they will ride up over many obstacles and your seeding depth can be quite variable. You'll get a more uniform seeding depth with a, uh, with a shank opener. Now what we haven't done here, we haven't set the, the seeding depth. So we don't know what depth it's gonna be seeding at. We haven't set the calibration rate. We haven't tried it in the field. We don't know what depth that the front, uh, th have I given enough disclaimers? I, so, and with 30 people standing around here, nothing's gonna work, it's a given. You know, when you go to give a demonstration with more than one person around, things don't work, okay? I mean, that's just, that's just the standard procedure. So I have just eyeballed, what we have here is a a dual seed meter and it is a two-sided thing one is a fluted feed but one side is small for things like millet or small seed or like radish seed or whatever that that sort of a thing and the other is a, for the larger beans corn and so forth uh, seed and there's a there's a metal slide here that you uh, uncover one of the uh, one side or the other of the meter with we do have, we have a fertilizer, starter fertilizer site also for the crops that can use it. We found out real quick, you don't want to use that with beans, but with corn it works as long as you use a, uh, a non-toxic level and, and mixture of, of starter fertilizer. So, so the problem is too high salts for the beans? Yeah, apparently so. It just knocked the, the germination like crazy. Now, we were talking upstairs about strip tillage. Uh, one thing that you can do with strip tillage is you can use this machine, for instance, and you can go th run your rows deeper than what you're going to plant, and you can put fertilizer down. And then you can come back a week or two later or whenever you want and plant more shallow right over top of those same rows. Your fertilizer is down deep, you're less burning effect, and you've got some starter fertilizer down especially your P205, which helps uh, early uh, growth of the crop. So there are different options that you can use. So this, this machine, I know I sound like I'm selling it, but it, it can be used as a strip till machine, as a direct planter, a direct seeding planter, or you can actually come back and side dress fertilizer between rows with the thing. So, it's so, John, I brought you here to sell it if you want. I mean, uh, go ahead and promote it. That's fine. You know, you know you're I coming mean, this far. If you want to promote it, that's that's you the know, point. I, you know, I, you know, it's just, it's just I'm just trying to explain the product. You know, it's, you know, this is what it is. You know, and they're available from Stone Mountain Engineering up in uh, Johnson City is building them right at the moment for us, and uh, World Help is doing the best we can to try to get them out into the whoever can use them. And what would it run a, a farmer to buy one? These are priced at twelve sixty right now. Very reasonable. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, for the global market, we need to get the price down lower, but we haven't been able to do that because, well, you know, it's it's heavy, durable, it'll last forever. Uh, the parts are very replaceable. Like that's a Yetter uh, finger wheel up there. This is a Great Plains uh, disc. This is uh, Case International. Uh, uh, tip 
off from their uh, air drills and so forth. So the, 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 re the replacement parts that you would get from the wear and the soil are all you know locally available. And basically everything else is tough, rugged, and it shouldn't, uh, stainless steel box, you know, it should last forever. Okay, so what I've done is I've just uh, randomly set the calibration on this thing so that the seed pockets are about about the size of the seed, and we have we have we have no idea in here. We have no idea what we're going to do or how we're going to do. Okay. All right. Let's see here. Now it's a trick to turn these things around at the end of the field. And uh, those of you who have got walking tractors, do you have wheel brakes? Do you have individual brakes? Who had, who had the walking tractors? Do you have brakes? Yeah. See, I don't have brakes on this thing. So you can't steer with brakes? Yeah. yeah, so the guys down, in, the young guys down in Mexico, they just, in two minutes, figured out, hey, you come to the end of the row, you just throttle it back, hit the brake, and you reach, you reach back here to pick up the tail end, and it just walks itself right around, set it down, and you're going again. I don't have brakes, so I, I can't do that. We didn't buy an expensive enough tractor. Okay, so let's just try just getting started a little bit and, because I don't know what depth. We may, not, we may not even be in the ground because the, 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 uh, uh, the shank may have to be lowered. The good news, because we have irrigation and we're in a greenhouse, if you get it in the ground at all, it'll work. You don't have to get real deep. Yeah, but we'd like to demonstrate. Yeah, sure. Yeah. OK. OK, normally you'd be planting beans, what, inch deep, corn, inch and a half? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Something like that? Yeah, outside. In the greenhouse, we tend to plant shallower. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can someone give me a pull, please? Yeah, OK, OK. True, true, true. Thank you. Start if it up. wasn't for Becky, we wouldn't make it here. OK, so yeah, we're in transport mode. And what we do is that we pull it. We have to pick it up, and with your with your third hand, I can't. I, yeah, it's picking up. There. Okay. There we go. Thank you. That'll look more reasonable. Okay. Yeah. Can you give me a pull, please? No. We need it down. A dead man switch. Yeah, this man. I shouldn't do this, right? Don't don't do this. Exactly, don't do this. Don't put a rubber band over your dead man switch. As an industrial engineer, I say don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, please. You can cheat. You can step on. You can step step on the stuff and get it out of there if it stays the building.
Right now, it's supposed to be pushing it. Yeah, it's not. It's not doing much. Yeah. So eventually it's starting to pile up too much, but it did pretty good for quite a while, right? Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's accumulating a little bit. But I'm making too much of a mess. Uh -huh. Well, it wouldn't be hard to come back and push that in. So normally that just falls back in? Yeah, you would normally not. This is really mellow. Uh-huh. You, you wouldn't normally be having that much disturbance. No, we've been, we've been building the heck out of this cell for a long time. Uh, yeah. Should we try to see where, where the seed is? Yeah, see where the seed is. I don't know. Are we? There's always a case to try and find seed. You can't yeah, find it. Yeah, okay, there's one. Yeah. Okay. So that's down to a good depth. That was, yeah, that, that seed was there about an inch deep. It was, I picked it out, it was about an inch deep below that. Now this, this is sinking in so much. Well, it's soft and it's moist, right? Uh -huh. So you don't want that much disturbance. No, we'd rather not have that much disturbance. Yeah, 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 yeah I is agree. Is there any adjustment you can make to have less? Uh, not have as big a guy on here. Uh-huh. <laughs> Well, probably since you're the operator, we'll let you keep operating. Uh, you're really not that big a guy, you know? <laughs> so, uh, Just try it and see. We it's... Push it back. Maybe I'll go behind you and push it back in so that you can come down well, another row, okay? So what we're going to do, we're going to try to make three rows on this well, bed, right? two at least. Maybe three might be hard, but if you can do, do three, it'd be great, you know? We'll see. Okay. We've got a tube up here. Oh, okay. Well, he's got a tube up here. Yeah, I, 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 I can't, I can't turn it. I'm not strong enough. He's got a. You want to back it up? Mm. See, normally we would turn around in a field, but we can't turn around. Uh, maybe that's the way. Okay, where's... Yeah. There we go. Okay, now the, the problem with this is that I'm driving on the the, the two planted rows. I don't. Yeah, I don't think. Well, no, I just thought maybe people might want to talk. So, this is a lot of loose soil, and I don't think you don't like that. You know, I'm guessing, you know, I'm guessing that you don't like that. And uh, it's real mellow in here, of course, and all that, but you, if you're doing good market gardening, you've got mellow soil, right? Uh, if you're, it's just kind of like, this is what you get with this kind of mechanization. Uh, you know, if you're looking at a cornfield and you're out planting on 30 inch rows, that looks like acceptable kind of, 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 of looseness of the soil. Right. Uh, but for market gardening, I don't know if you like it or if you don't. You know, that's, that's, that's a question. You know? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, we'll, just, we'll see how well it produces. 
see how the soil responds. We are seeing that not every bean got in. We know well, I don't know. some of the beans were like falling off to the side and were in the residue. We it, I don't know. Oh, I, and I don't know why. Um, Probably they're hitting residue and being bounced off. Would that be now, it? Now, is this cover crop, is it pulling up so it's uprooting the soil? Because I don't know. I mean, that could be it. It might like be doing that. It might if be. If it was dead, that's probably what's happening. It's if it was dead, dead, but it, it wouldn't pull yeah, up the soil because I've never seen it do this. Uh, mm -hmm. What are they yeah, getting? Why are they where are they coming it is. off? I don't know where the why the beans are. Where uh, I don't know where they're going. Well, they're um, I think it's because this is the the cover crop is just pulling. It's being pulled up by the roots. This was also like not completely connected in there. Now it is. I think maybe this is just falling out. Oh yeah. So it was falling oh, yeah. sideways. That might have been it. See how it's not all the way in. It may be. Yeah. I don't know where the beans. I wasn't watching it, so it wasn't. No. But I mean, the thing is, yeah, it's not they're, connected on this side. Definitely. They're all probably going to grow anyways. They're close enough in. See, like there's one all the way out there. Yeah, I noticed, but we, yeah, should, yeah we wouldn't normally have that. Yeah. yeah, that probably has to do with the thing, the thing being loose. I don't know if the roots yeah, would throw it that far. Connected yeah. on this side. Yeah. The wire's not going through the hook. So oh, isn't it? Nope. Oh, okay. That would be why. Yeah. Where was? Where, Over where, here. Where, where? Right here. Oh. So he told you things had to go wrong, right? He promised you that, right? Yeah. You can count on it. Yeah, if it was dead, then it wouldn't uproot so much. Yeah, it's it's newly chopped. I mean, once I heard you guys needed it to be like that, we no. needed to chop this out. Yeah. Well, those yeah. are... Um, we talked about that earlier. But it wasn't uh, those are adapters that you get. Let's see. Oh, you haven't... You, oh, there was a... We can take those off. He had a question. He had a question here, so we can... We can you can see what what the deal is. So I bought uh, I bought these hubs, these from uh, Earth Earth Tools up in Kentucky, and then these things are a dollar a pound, right? And uh, so that's that's how we added more weight to the wheels. And so you got the you got the this isn't a double hub. Uh, it's what now? It's like a double hub. Well, it's just this just goes on bolts on to the to the standard hub to give you so that you can get more weight. It's just available. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's maybe. Your rim is long. Maybe. Deeper than mine. Ah, maybe. And there we go. So. So I'm thinking maybe we'll finish this row and rather than try and do another row, we'll just go on to other stuff. That, that's great with us. We really appreciate the time and everybody's interest. Mm -hmm. And uh, Yeah, it's only because of time. Otherwise, I'd love no, to do no, all no. the rows. No, no, that's, that's yeah. fine. That's fine. Yeah. Now, we've taken almost an hour. That's fine. And that you came far enough that I'm glad you did, you know. So. Uh, I think this is a really reasonable price for a tool that could be very useful for large scale. Obviously, it's not for a backyard garden. It's not enough for the greenhouse. I don't, you know, it's kind of hard to turn around and all of that. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But if a person is planting uh, 10 rows of corn every 10 days or something like that, that's the sort of thing, then I would anticipate that this could be a very useful mm -hmm. type of a, of a, of a machine. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we actually want to put a whole bunch of different forage crops in a four acre field and that could be very useful. Yeah. yeah. Maybe more on like a, a two foot spacing. So it wouldn't seem like a lot of that much disturbance for two wood. It's much heavier soil, so it wouldn't get into it. So, and you can borrow it back and dry it if you want to. Okay. Yeah, yeah that'd be great. Yeah. Totally. You really say you used a mule to, yeah. to pull with this? Yeah, we, we uh, yeah. For, for, for animal draft, what we've got is a, a two row or two wheel tow kind of thing with a hitch on it. Okay. And it's just got a, and then it has a hitch on the back of it that we can just attach this with one pin, drop pin, right? And then we put a we put a handlebar up here for the driver, right, to give him a little more balance. Okay. okay. And then he's just standing here and and, and driving. Yeah. And one mule is enough. Are you enough? Are we, you making enough now to, to do those? We that? we've just we've just prototyped them and. and Minimal little bits, you know, but uh, it's very simple to have the machine shop make them. Okay. You know, we have the designs and whatnot, and we have them in the shop. We have them both for the single animal and for the team. And really, a single animal can pull something like this very easily. But 
But then you get a situation like with single animal, that if you've got a single hitch, then the animal's gonna be walking right in line with what you're gonna be doing. And if that's not a problem, that's not a problem. But if you rather not, then you need, then you use a team will get you out. So they're walking in the, in the middle. So down where we live, we use Bermuda grass for grazing the horses during the summer. But to try to put rye seed in in the winter, getting under the mat of that grass is very hard to do. Do you think this could do something like that? For coastal, we, we've, we've run in coastal a little bit. And it just, it'll just tear out. It'll go in the ground, uh -huh. but it tears out chunks, you know, because the coastal roots are so fibrous and so that you just get a big chunk torn out here and here and here, and it just makes a ragged mess, okay. honestly. Not the thing is, if you're going to, if you've got stuff, whether it's residue on the top or whether if it's a whole bunch of root mass that you've got to cut through, if you definitely got to cut through it, you're probably, you're going to do it two ways. You're going to put a colder disc on and put a tremendous amount of weight on it to cut down through, or you're going to have a power cutter. Okay, and that's that's your technical alternatives, and you could put and for a market gardener, you could have a power cutter. Mm -hmm. You know the expense. I mean, you could have another little engine if you didn't have a power takeoff off your tractor. You could have another little engine sitting there and running like a one row, uh, not well, not uh, a rotary hole. What they do is the, the rotary tillers, they take the, the, the normal tiller blades off and they put straight blades on them so that they'll just cut a slot. And if you just had, if you just had one set of blades cutting a slot through all this stuff, then you can get through. But you, you, yeah, you gotta do that. Yeah. somehow you've got to get through it and you're just not going to do it with passive. I mean, this is, this is just like, you know, cover crop and weed roots and nothing like grass and it's even pulling up clumps, you know, yeah. so yeah. So. yeah. Yeah. Why don't you finish that row out? Okay, and yeah, and thank you so much for your time and your attention, everybody. Any thank more you. questions? I didn't see what you have. We have a hand push no-till drill ah. in Brazil. Have you ever tried to hand push a no-till drill? Well, you can do it in, in, we just did it in a field where it's just like modest residue. Okay. Yeah. I don't know, I think it'd be pretty hard to do it in this. Yeah. It's, uh, we, just, we just seeded a bunch of grains last week, but it was just like, yeah. it wasn't, you know, the cover crop didn't do well and there were residues from crops. So we were able to go through that stuff. Where is the drill? It's under the t it's that orange thing that's underneath the deck. So we're gonna pull it in here and probably. We we would not get very far probably. If we were gonna try it, I'd do it in this because that's not near. It'd have to be deader and sit there longer to go through it. I think. You know? I'd really suggest in that situation that a guy have two wives and he puts them on a rope and they pull. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Take about five husbands to match those two wives, right? Yeah. Anyway. Anyway. So be it. Okay, thank you all. <laughs> I'll just go up there with it. Yeah. Okay, let's go. He's used to heavier soil. Like heavier. That's designed to go through, you know, farm soil. That's greenhouse soil. That's been babied, right, you know. Right. I mean, if you have a greenhouse, you make the best soil in the world because it's really expensive soil, right. you know. You want to get maximum production, you know. Okay, thank you for your patience. I had to say goodbye. He's got to move on. They have a demo in Illinois tomorrow. Um, so this is it. I was tickled that we had access to this. 
Mark Dempsey, who works with us on a lot of our projects. Um, I first saw him do a presentation with David, what's David's last name? I forget it. Mortensen, I think, um, a University of Pennsylvania professor. They did the best ecology of weeds kind of workshop I've ever seen. Mark then moved down here and we enlisted him to help us with a mugwort eradication process that we're doing. We're using no-till methods but with big tractors, so I haven't talked about it much. But I might cover it a little bit more. I mentioned it a little bit when we talked about whether or not seeds could come up through the heavy residue. Um, anyway, I don't know how he got this, but a, a, a professor named Weil, I think, um, from University of Maryland, Maryland, I think, imported it from Brazil. And we had a chance to show it. But I realized that we don't really spend a lot of time on it because it's not likely anybody's going to import one. You know, um, If they ever become available, we could see it. So it, it does the same kind of thing. It's got a, um, a disc. Remember you were saying how a disc can pack more? But it's got a disc to cut. Um, and then as it cuts, right behind the disc, the seed is dropping through. You put the seed in here. okay. And then back here, it's got these two wheels that are kind of pulling the soil back over on it, so it's being set. And you just walk it through. And he was just saying, good luck doing it in a, in, a, in a bed like that, and I think it's probably true. But we did it in a bed of not at all work soil um, that had residue from you know, crops and not very well-established cover crops. And we were able to push it through. It worked. You know? So it, you can do it. You know, it can take some muscle, but it is an option. If they were available, I'd buy one, you know. But um, I'm probably not going to bother to bring it up from Brazil. I'd buy one mostly to show and to use on smaller patches. Maybe in the greenhouse, it'd be perfect, actually, you know. But not in that freshly flail mode um, cover crop. That's still, that needs to die more. And it should have died, but it's been so cool that, that, you know, usually if you cut a crop that's going to seed and it's hot, it just dies. But if it's cool, it's sitting there thinking, do I have a chance still? But then it gets hot and it's like, oh, screw it. You know, I'm not going to make it. You know? um, and so we just didn't have perfect conditions. As I was telling John, he wrote me about the possible rain for this week. And I said, you know, we've had hardly any, any rain at all this year. You know? All these predictions and it never comes here. So I'm not too worried. And then, of course, it all came. You know? and that's, that's how it always works. So this here, Mark actually makes his own um, seed plates. He ordered this plastic from somebody because they're real expensive, but you can make your own and drill them, you know. The seed plate goes in there, drop the seed through there, and it gets calibrated by turning around. It's all ground driven. Um, and we'll see, how, you know, I, I, I just didn't have time to go check. We planted sorghum last year, and I have no idea how well it did. Last week, rather. Um, you know, it was pretty, pretty big spacing, so it'd be interesting to see how well it comes up. I'll try and get a picture of it, and we maybe can post it on the web, and you yeah, can see. Well, he purposely wanted it spaced pretty wide for sorghum. But then, if the machine's working erratically, that can be a problem, you know. But he was going to assume best, the best case scenario, so he had the right spacing he wanted. And that, all the results of that are going to be at our um, August grain, growing gra small grains. And Mark Dempsey, the person that brought this, is going to be teaching that. So that should be a good workshop, too. All right, so other tools that we use. Um, did the sides ever make it back over here, do you know? Or is it still out in the field? OK, all right, cool. Let's take this up and get that on the blade. I like that blade get covered. Can I get you to do that when we go up? OK. Not now, just when we, when we go up again. You know. Um, OK, so if you don't want to cultivate and work the soil, right, then you want to not have to work with a lot of weeds. So if you were to do something like cover that bed and let with some kind of fabric, or you can use mulch, by the way, too. You don't have to use fabric, right? You, could just use, you don't want to use a weedy mulch, though, right? You wouldn't use hay, but you could use straw. And you can cover all that residue, or leaves, like I did at, the, at Mountain Air. You could just cover that and leave it for probably a good amount of time to get the impact you want. Probably in the summer, it might work in about three, four weeks. In cooler weather, you might go six or eight. But then eventually, you come back in, and that residue, which is you cover it when it's green and juicy, and ideally either spread some compost or put some compost tea so you get a lot of activity. You come back, by the time you get back, what was residue is now fine, dark, organic material. And you can plant right into that really easily. The problem is you may find that once there's light, that what you plant is covered up with weeds. So what you might do instead, especially if it was Sudex, you want to give it a little bit more time, is do what they call stale bedding, where you water that bed, right, and you let the weeds grow. And then once they're at the cotyledon stage, are not much bigger, all of the annual weeds, not grasses and stuff, they've got a, you know, a tip below the soil that's not going to kill, but all the annual weeds, you go over with the flamer. The flamer's not trying to burn them. 
you're walking so fast that the plants are still green when you pass them, but they've turned to darker green and their cells have all boiled and burst. And you can tell that by just pressing on one, you'll leave a finger imprint. And within a, within a half an hour to an hour or two, everything there will be withered up and gone. Now you've done no soil disturbance and you've killed every weed that germinated. You do that maybe three times and then the day before you're going to plant, come out to the end of the bed and plant a small patch. So let's say it's carrots, they take a long time to germinate, right? The day they pop, you know the next day they're going to pop in the bed, you flame one more time. And you walk really fast because they're right near the surface, but you get every last weed. The carrots are on an equal footing, it'll be basically no need to cultivate. You'll have, you know, maybe, you know, half an hour of weeding for a big long bed. You know, the few weeds that make it. So that's another thing that you can add to your toolbox to do no-till. Um, and it can save the time of mulching, though mulching also has a, a positive impact because it's protecting the soil and stuff. But it takes a good while to do it, you know. And I wouldn't even think about doing that for anything except for those slow seeding things like beets, maybe spinach, carrots, maybe onions, those kind of things that are going to come up slow and the weeds are going to get ahead of them. It's just not worth the time otherwise, you know. Any questions about that? Asparagus, basically prepare that bed really well when you start. Don't have any perennial weeds in there and keep it mulched out really well. Just keep piling the mulch on. I worked for a man who piled two feet of sawdust every year and his asparagus kept growing great. You know, he never worked it in and he just, you know, he made it impossible for any weed that did make it up that high could be pulled out with one finger, you know. And, um, you know, he had complete control. We don't go that far, but we try to just mulch it to control it, you know. That's, that's usually the best process. But really, it's about not letting it be full of bad weeds when you get in there. It's a 20-year crop. It's worth a year of preparation to not have the weeds in there. You know, you don't want to, in fact, where we want to move it to has got mugwort in it. We're getting that mugwort out before we move it there, you know, because it'll drive us nuts. You won't be able to control it, you know. So just take your time and get rid of it, and then it'll be an easy crop, you know. You could experiment with establishing something like clover in there, and then just keep it well mulched right around each plant. So the clover can't come in. The clover will invade a little, but you can pull it back pretty easy if it's well mulched. So most of your bed could have a living mulch, which is going to be way more dynamic than having the whole bed mulched. You know? Any other questions about that? OK. Um, trying to think of what other no OK, so other no-till methods for very small scale is lasagna bed. You know, the, the bed that he just went over had a little bit of lasagna bedding. Because when you want to raise up that side, it's wetter on that side. The one behind, next to that was totally lasagna bedded. It was, well, there's a whole video, it's called What Ground, and it shows us putting tons of materials down there. And we didn't need to do it to get rid of bad weeds and prepare the soil. We needed to do it to build it up. But we could have done the same kind of lasagna bed on top of even quack grass. If we put cardboard down first, it would control it totally there. You would have to, then have to come in and put a heavy mulch on either side, or the grasses would come back in from there. You know, you can't. You don't get rid of grasses by killing them only while you're on a plant. You have to kill them so that they cannot come back in from the, you need a defensive perimeter to control grasses, you know. But if you do that, it's a, for small scale, it's probably the quickest way to prepare a place with bad pernicious weeds. You know, those roots can easily grow down through that cardboard, but those weeds can't, cannot, come, cannot make up through it, you know. Um, if it were something like mugwort that's long lived, I would probably build a lasagna bed the year before because the mugwort might just survive and come back up. Nut sedge is another one. It tends to just sit there and wait for light. But the thing is, if you lasagna bed, it's never going to get enough light to come up, probably. It probably won't get that, you know, it's just not, it's too deep in. Um, but I'm not sure about that, but I suspect that's the case. Um, but lasagna, people, everybody know what lasagna bedding is? Do I have to explain it to anybody? Yeah. Basically, it's layering lots of readily rottable material. And you start with the coarsest stuff on the bottom. Oftentimes, if you're trying to control weeds, you know, pernicious weeds, you want to put cardboard down first, you know. And as you work your way up, you get juicier and juicier. And then to be able to plant immediately, my trick is to kind of like take this very, you know, weird stuff. It could be any number of things, coffee grounds, juice pulp waste, you know, weeds, all that different stuff, right? Maybe a little bit of compost on top. What I like to do is maybe shovel whatever good soil there is on the path so it isn't full of bad weeds. Throw that on top so I have at least a little bit of soil. But then to plant, I'll make a hole in that material, which is very loose, as if it were a pot, like a four inch pot. And I'll fill that with spent potting soil or some other soil that's good for growing. I stick my plant in that, it grows like it's in a pot. By the time it's big enough to get out of that pot, there's enough rot that it can grow. And it just keeps following the rot down. It might grow through one layer that doesn't want to rot. 
and it goes down and it finds what it needs. You know? And plants can do very well that way. Dig in garden, start producing food in March, a cold, dry March, so the lasagna bed was slow, but they still were delivering food for stuff that in a bed that was open pasture before that, right? Hadn't been worked, um, and they were delivering food by July. You know? And if it hadn't been so wet and so dry and cold, it would have been June. But the stuff just didn't rot as fast, so we were kind of stalled out for a while until the rotting happened. Um, it works best in the summer when there's more, you know, more, more warmth and water, which is what makes things rot. You know? Okay, yeah? We just had a lasagna bed that was not completely decomposed, but mm -hmm. we needed to plant it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and move it to the side. You didn't need to. The plants would have grown right through that cardboard. But it's really thick cardboard. Like I think it's... There's a lot of cardboard. It's wet. I would no. Try it next time. Right. Put some now. Find, find a place where, there, where it still is and plant, and I bet you those roots make it through. They just, they're strong. If they, have, if they have the power of the sun, they can go through. It's that tip with no sun below the cardboard that can't find its way up, you know? But that root is designed to make it down past rocks, around rocks, you know? Um, but I haven't seen any cardboard stop a root going down. It was for direct seed okra. Yeah, I, I, just do an experiment. Do me a favor. Plant a little bit over the cardboard and let me know what happens. But I was doing that perimeter, mm -hmm. like 18 inch to the side, so mm -hmm. the perimeter was going to carry mm -hmm. it. Yeah. I mean, it, you can cut it if you need to, but I don't think you do. See, it gets wet, and then it's just like, you know, it's pretty soft. And the root just grows down through like funguses do, you know. And, you know, they're stalled out for a little while. It takes a little time, but I think they just keep going, you know. Um, but let me know, you know, I mean, was it like this much cardboard? Yeah, that might, it might stop it. Three or four layers. Yeah, that might stop it. It might, you know. But see, it might go through one, go sideways, find another place that it likes, and then go down to the other, you know. Yeah. I mean, that's what roots do. They go, I mean, I've had, I have a, I had a farm in Silo that when people came to tour it, they said, this was a road once, right, because there's that many rocks in it, you know. And you would think the plants couldn't grow in there. They boomed. They just went around the rocks, you know. Yeah, it's very slow food, but it would, it would stop it too, but they don't. They just go around it. I've had voles riddle an onion bed so that it was mostly tunnels. The roots go around the sides and keep going. The onions were gorgeous, you know, even though I could stick my hand in anywhere and hit a hole, you know. But there still had to be tunnels. There still were the sidewalls. They went around the sidewall and kept going, you know. So you can count on roots to do a whole lot if they've got that engine pushing them, you know. Uh, Mm -hmm. where there was no light getting through, I moved it and it has all been tilled by mold. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they'll till it up. They, they, if, there's, if there's insects to eat in there, worms and stuff, they'll tear it up. It's nice and warm. I mean, yeah, totally they'll tear it up. Yeah. Um, and they are tillers too. You know, every pest we don't like is actually doing good stuff. I mean, you know, they're all doing good work. Um, it's just that they don't do the work that we want and they get in the way of what we're trying to do. It doesn't mean that their agenda doesn't fit in the world. Of course it does. You know? um, any other questions on that? All right, let's see. So I haven't really talked about um, how we actually get things planted here. A little bit I did, but basically some things are more soil working than others. When the guys plant the corn, they like to actually like just like chop up you know, the soil right in that strip. They just like to do it that way. Um, if it had been dry, I would have run this in there to see how that compared. You know. But they don't mind that work. I hate that work. I think it's really hard. So that's why I put that mulch down to see if it was, could be easier to put it in. And I'm going to actually try coming through, not sure what, probably flail mowing, knocking that um, vets down more like we were doing today with my tool, and then coming through with the flail mower and chopping the heck out of it, waiting a couple of weeks for it until it's kind of like fluffy and easy to get through. And I'm going to try pushing through that row with this just to see if there's another way. Or we might get to borrow that tool again. I'd like to try that out there. You know, I don't, you know. It's different. Everybody's got the ways they like and don't like, and um, I don't like the tediousness of that. You know, uh, my coworkers just think it's a ritual. They're fine with it. You know, they come through and they chop it up and plant. What about so. your cover crop seed? Did you start broadcasting that? Okay, so um, if you want to go back in that greenhouse later on and look on the left side, there's a spectacular example of chop and drop totally working wonderfully. Eventually, it'll look like that out here, where I showed you, but it's growing slower because of the weather. In there, it's all popped. And it was a weedy bed um, with scraggly cover crop and um, I think some poorly established collards. It was just not a good looking bed at all. 
and you would think that you couldn't get enough stuff from it to cover that seed up and get it to, to do well. Just scattered the seed over, came through and flail mowed it, and boom, it's all got gorgeous cover crop all over it. And that's what we do exclusively, you know. Um, the only thing, time we don't do that is if we want to under sow. And then we just kind of just throw it under and count on the shade and the rain, frequent rain we get, and it works pretty well usually. If we were in a drought, that might not work as well. But we actually have spring-fed sprinklers so we could cheat and turn the water on, you know. And um, we don't, we do not drill cover, cover crop seed at all here. Now, we have 30 acres in north, on the North River, uh, North Mills River, and there we're using a no-till drill. You know, that's a lot of acreage. We want to get it in well. And still, half of a field didn't take last year. We don't really know why. We were a little late, but I think it's more the weed pressure that was there. There's a lot of grass, and it probably just didn't, you know, literally just the drill didn't get down deep enough and the seed was sitting too high and froze out or whatever. Is that um, yeah, that's a big, that's a $14,000 to $20,000 implement, you know. Um, and it's way heavy and takes a big, strong tractor, and boy, it does a great job. You know, it's amazing what it does. And literally, you can knock down, like, cover crop that's, like, this high. I should have put a picture of those cover crops with Ray and David Brandt. You remember how high that was? The residue is like this. And you can come through, knock that down, drill through it, and the cover crop's right back up. And that's great for killing mugwort because the mugwort's nowhere near. You know, it can't really get back up that fast. You know, it's still struggling. It's a broader leaf and it's coming up right at the surface and it can't go anywhere. Whereas that little seed can just push this little cotyledons up through there and it gets the canopy first. Um, it's working pretty well, you know. And you could accomplish that on a small scale, but it would be something like that planting tube or something, you know. Or simply seeding first and then knocking it over and seeing how it comes up through. If you're not doing vetch, I bet you it works well. If you're doing that vetch, that tangle is probably going to slow it down really fast, a lot, you know because it mats so much. The other cover crops, they knock over, but there's spaces still. You know, there's places. Plants don't have to go straight. They can go, you know, they'll do that. But if it's, if they go this way, and then this way, and then this way, and they're still hitting mat, you know, eventually they'll run out of steam. So they need light someplace close to where they're coming up, and then it works pretty well. Um, yeah, I'd say that's probably the easiest one that anybody can implement right now is like overseed, chop, and drop. Underseed all of your crops. Grow your, you know, always have a cover crop growing under your plants. Make sure you time it so it doesn't compete, or make sure it's easy enough to kill if it does. Um, and then actually, what we do is we have summer cover crops growing under corn or under tomatoes or whatever. Then it's middle of August, crop's not out yet, right? Gee, I want to get my winter cover crop in. We just throw it out there, and it's like, what are you doing? There's no room here, but it germinates. And it's like, can I please have some room? Can I please? No. And the other plants are like, no, no, no. But then they get frosted, and it's like, boom, it's released. And it's totally established, and it's way ahead, you know. And it didn't die. It just kind of sat there and malingered, you know. But the minute it's released by the frost, it's up and growing, you know. Yeah. Uh, what's a good source of uh, cover crop seed? Okay, so um, fifth season has, has seed. Lots of the seed and, feed and seeds have them. They don't have the unusual ones as much that I like to grow. They might have Sudex, but it's usually treat it, you know. So if you don't want to treat it, um, there's a company called Walnut Creek Seeds. And um, David Brandt and Jay Brandt, and I think his wife's name is Ann, and they sell pounds. Pound is about seven bucks retail, I think. They'd be shipping too. I'm trying to convince, you know, all of you go in there and tell fifth season they need to carry it. I'm sorry, what, Walnut Creek Seed. Seed. Yeah, David Brandt and Jay Brandt. They're in Ohio, I forget the town, but if you put Walnut Creek Seed, David and Jay Brandt, you'll find them, you know. And if they have a website, I'm pretty sure you can probably order direct. What I love is they have multi-species cover crops, a great mix. There's brassicas in some of them, you know. You could also, you know, small scale, you could just pull those brassicas out and eat them. Let them get big enough that they're food and then go through and harvest them, and then they're not a problem. By the time the harlequin bugs are showing up, you go, sorry, I'm eating that. You guys can go try and feed on something else, which they don't do very well, you know. Um, and so I'd recommend them because they will give you the unusual cover crops that you can't easily buy at all. Sun hemp, good luck buying that in a feed and seed, you know. Um, and they'll give you the inoculant, both the mycorrhizal and the rhizobial inoculant. You know, and they give it to you in a package so you can put it in when you want. That's gold. Those inoculants are expensive, and for the unusual legumes, they're hard as all heck to find. And if you're going to buy them, you've got to buy this big bag, which you're not going to use. And you're not going to convince anybody to carry them because they don't sell enough of them. They got a, a, a go stale date, you know. But he breaks it down. So I think it's a huge service. I highly recommend them. You know, I think you know if I was doing that size, I'd be buying from them. Instead, we get a pallet, you know. 
and I can say, oh, throw this one type on, throw this one type on, and we get, you know, because we're buying a pallet, we can, you know, do real well that way. Um, so. Without the yeah, I don't think they have that kind of um, diversity of cover crop seeds. I haven't seen them, anyways. You know. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, they have those. Yeah, but I'm encouraging you to go for much more. You know. Yeah. Mm -mm, tell us about them. Um, Speak loud. They, well, they just do all kinds of mixes for all different types of the country, all areas of the country. Uh huh. And you can get your, uh, irrigation mixes and riverbank mixes and uh, runoff mixes. What's the name of the company? Pardon me? Ernest. Like Ernest. Importance of being earnest. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I mean, I bought some creek seeds to plant them on. Mm -hmm. the Do they have things like under sowing seeds for cover, for crops and yeah. stuff like I that? Mean, they've got just about everything that you ever So they sound like they're worth looking at too. Are they, are they untreated? Uh, I think you'd have to. Yeah. You know. Okay, so my lesson there is even if they can get you untreated, you need to send it to them in writing. And let them know that if they send you treat it, you'll be sending it back at their cost, or not paying for it and throwing it away. You know, they've got to put it totally on them. And if they won't deal with that, then you don't buy from them. Because even when they're well-meaning, like Kaufman Seed, very well-meaning, but a new employee, three bags of treated seed. Now, they were great. I shipped it back at their cost. I got a total refund. I still had to go up to the place to ship it. And I, of course, had opened each one of those bags because I didn't believe they would be treated. And nowadays, instead of a separate label, one side has what the seed is, and the back side says treated. So I had to open up each one and see pink or purple, and then go, you know, and call them up. And they were totally apologetic. And said, yeah, he's just a new employee, you know, and just didn't. But I realized now I should have just said backwards and forwards to him, and I'm sending you a text, and I will be returning this. And do you know how much it costs to ship this seed? I mean, they lost several hundred dollars on that order, you know. So what you treat it? Treat it with fungicides, not allowed in organic, and really stupid if you if you think about it. You want mycorrhizae to get in, in connected as soon as passed. And you're killing fungi, you know? Not a good idea. And carcinogenic, by the way. I mean, some of those seed treatments, anyways, are carcinogenic. And they're, they're labeled seeded? Uh, seeded? They, yeah, usually they have, a, they have a warning that it's treated. If they're dyed pink or purple, they're, you look real close because almost invariably that means it's treated with fungicides or insecticides, you know? I mean, they, they put neonicotinoids on seed, you know? I mean, nasty stuff, you know? So you want to buy, and if, if they have a lot of treated seed, I don't know if it's worth the struggle. I just have an honest talk. Are we going to be able to work together? You know, are you really going to be able to pay attention and make sure we never get treated seed? They probably don't want to bother. If they have a lot of treated seed, they're selling to that market. You're just going to be a pain. You know, it's better to find a company that gets and respects that, and will work with it. And Kaufman Seed is fine that way. They're good. Um, I think Central Seed. I really like them for um, for the best like description of different ways to use them foraging with animals. And that's a piece we haven't talked about much, but you can do it on a small scale. Does anybody have animals or plan on having animals? Okay, so if you're willing to mob graze them really densely, you can try no-till drilling them. But what we're about to try, and I bet you it works, is to come in right before we mob graze them. Now, it won't work with chickens because they'll eat every one of the seeds, right? But for, like, goats, sheep, you know, you come in and you mob graze them dense enough that they're going to trample that too, right? And you let them eat it way down. You're not trying to have it regrow, right? And what you do is you overseed before they get in there. And then they trample it in. It drops in. There's all that poop, the residue there. I bet you it pops up and grows great, you know? Um, we're about to try that on a bunch of crops that we want to grow to feed chickens. And we don't have that no-till drill. And Rock was like, we've got to get some kind of drill pad. And I said, let's try this. This is even better because we can show people you can do it with no equipment. You just use your animals, you know? And that really is, as far as I'm concerned, that's the future. All that, all those feedlots in the Midwest, I mean, right now, I had a guy who lives out there come through and he was talking to me, he said, you know, there's piles of corn that are like huge, they're just sitting out in the weather, not, that's not selling. They, they can't ship it anywhere else. So we can grow it for us, but the rest of the world's too smart to eat that crap, you know? So they don't have a market for it. And so their, their model is, in, is getting fragile. It's getting, there's, there's problems there. They're gonna raise the amount of ethanol to put in our cars, though. I mean, they gotta, you know, I know. I mean, you know. but, Meanwhile, if we can get them to get that the cows come back out of the feedlots, intensively graze them, right? And a bunch of people are doing this now. Gabe Brown is one, very successful, right? 
intentionally graze them, and then you could actually reach a point where you graze them the pasture down so heavily that it's actually damaged a little bit. Then you come in and you no-till drill corn, um, soybeans, other forage crops, right? They'll grow up. The, the no-tilling will work. The pasture's damaged enough that they can take over, but that pasture's gonna recover in the shade. Then when you harvest, you have your pasture back. You never work the soil. That's what needs to happen. All that land is not supposed to be worked, right? The golf is dying, it's blowing away. We are mining, you know, millennia's worth of incredible soil building with the prairie system and the fires and the char and all that. And we're gonna run out. If, if we may well make our waterways so toxic before then that it won't matter, you know? So that's, that's a, a future piece that we can do on our scale. All right. Yeah, the video's there, you can see it totally. Mark Schoenbeck gives you more detail on cover crops than you could ever imagine. Ron Morris, another level of small scale no-till. We showed some of his stuff, a whole workshop, talking about similar stuff, you know? It's, right, it's not, at, it's not at the scale that we're talking about here, it's the next level up, but the information is applicable, okay? And there'll be time afterwards if you wanna hang for more questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.